I would like to apologize for yesterday's uh, technical problems that we experienced <clears throat> using Gather. Uh, many of us were dropped out of the session and many of us were able to rejoin. So thank you all for uh, waiting and being patient and rejoining for the rest of the sessions um, yesterday evening. Uh, today, I would like to introduce Professor Ulysses Cortez. I would like to remind everyone that we have 15 minutes for this talk, plus some questions from the audience at the end, if there are any. Professor Ulysses Cortez will be joining us from uh, a different video conferencing system, which is Google Meet. So we will be able to pass on questions to him, if you have any. Uh, please have, bear in mind that there are volunteers roaming around the virtual floor who can assist you. Please write your questions in the chat box addressed to one of the staff members, and they will forward them to the moderator to be read out loud. For those following the transmission via streaming, please enter your questions in the streaming service chat box as well, and we will make sure to forward them to the presenter. Today's conference is titled AI Lies and Data Tapes, and will be delivered by Professor Ulysses Cortez. He is a full professor and researcher of the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya since 1992, and he's been tenured since 1998, and uh, with the distinguished, uh, he's been distinguished as a full professor since 2006. He has worked on several areas of artificial intelligence in the computer science, formerly software development department, including knowledge acquisition for and concept formation in knowledge-based systems, as well as in machine learning and in autonomous intelligence agents. Since 2017, he is the research manager of the High Performance Artificial Intelligence Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Without further ado, it is my ultimate pleasure to introduce you, Professor Ulises Cortes. Ulises, please. Hola. Uh, supongo que me ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, Good morning, everybody. I, I believe that you are hearing me because uh, I'm not uh, hearing or watching anything. So uh, I believe that the organization will be telling me if there is any any problem. Uh, let me grant uh, my my best for the all the participants, uh, and uh, I like to thank the organization for inviting me. So my. My talk is AI lies and videotapes, and uh, I will be talking about AI. <clears throat> so uh, the plan of the day is uh, I will be talking about sex, lies, and videotapes. I will try to give um, a glance of the actual AI uh, and uh, how people understand AI in the public and why we have to fight to bring a better understanding about uh, the AI globally and uh, trying to organize uh, the explanation, the public explanation of AI in a better way than we have today. Then I will make a very short um, discussion about why it's good to invest in science. I will talk about AI in Mexico because of course, uh, <clears throat> the conference is in Mexico, and uh, I, I wanted of an internationalist in Mexico, and I want to focus my attention and your attention on what's going on in AI in Mexico. And at the end, I will be giving a modest proposal to improve the research and, and a research on AI in Mexico. So let us start. Um, when I first was invited to this talk, I was watching the very old and famous movie, Sex, Lies, and Videotapes. And I, I, I was captured by this uh, dialogue among two of the characters. So there's one uh, that is making, uh, while videotaping someone, uh, a woman, uh, Laura, uh, he's asking um, uh, or telling her, you are lying to Aunt Ju. And she answers, yes, right, but I didn't take a bow in front of God and everyone to be faithful to him. Well, if instead uh, of uh, Laura, you refer to Google, Microsoft, or any company that is using AI to produce some kind of uh, richness 
upon the data that we are giving to them, uh, that will be the exact uh, answer. So they are not faithful in taking care of our, of our data and they're using it in an indiscriminate way. And this of course is bringing um, an idea, maybe a, the wrong idea of AI. So if we believe that AI was meant for doing good as most of the science uh, today is uh, prepared to do good for, for societies, then uh, why we, um, we have this perception of AI can be bad. So uh, we are creating kind of uh, differentiation between the good AI and the uh, bad AI. And I will try to, to make a disquisition about these two positions on AI. So uh, if you go uh, the, to the streets and ask people about, about AI, you will answers you will get answers like this. Artificial intelligence has become one of the greatest meaningless buzzwords of our time. So no one knows exactly what those this artificial intelligence is. And if we have enough natural intelligence, why we need one that is artificial? Uh, the other main idea is that the AI is increasingly used as a political tool capable of shaping public opinion. Well, we have to remember what happened with the scandal of Cambridge Analytica, where uh, some uh, researchers in the UK were using information uh, extracted without permission from Facebook and used that information to be re-injected into Facebook groups and polarize the opinion. Uh, and they were championing uh, the campaign of Mr. Trump to be president and he become president of the United States. And in fact, was one of the first real proofs uh, in which we learned that our data used uh, in the appropriate, uh, appropriate between codes way can be used to modify the opinion of people. Uh, and But in this case, it's not buying uh, a new kind of uh, uh, perfume or a car. This is to elect uh, one of the most powerful persons on, on the world that is the president of the United States. You can imagine what can be done in every country in every moment to modify uh, the opinions of people using the appropriate algorithms to do that. The other uh, conception you can get if you talk to people, if you address people in the streets, is that the world of artificial intelligence is full of mystery, misconception that spreads faster than reality. Of course, uh, uh, AI is based on computer programs. And if you don't know how to program, then you don't understand what's going on. And of course, the nature of data, the, all the processes related, the way you capture your data, you accumulate the data and you use it uh, to produce information. And this information is re-elaborated to create knowledge, knowledge about people that can be sell. Uh, well, it's a process that is quite complex. It's very interesting. And normal people, street people will never uh, understand that if you are not communicating in the appropriate way. Even if you claim that you are transparent and you give the people uh, the programs and if they are unable to understand what's going on with the program because they are unable to program, then um, yeah, well, you've been transparent, but of course you are uh, clearly op opaque because you are giving uh, out uh, information that is not useful. And of course that spreads faster than reality because we are creating more and more communication infrastructures that uh, are able to communicate point to point almost every human in every single position uh, in the world uh, in the way that you can use internet to re uh, recall information uh, the amount of information you want the one you believe you need in the moment you wanted to have and that creates uh, a false impression of magic. Uh, so you just uh, call the genius of Google and you will get information back. The other thing that is more complicated to understand is that artificial intelligence is transparent, 
is ubiquitous and is persistent. And that makes uh, this uh, technology a force, uh, a, a strength that is not very easy to, uh, to understand. And it's not very easy to understand because um, we don't know which exactly is the part of AI that is running in one or other uh, program that you have in hand. And let me show you example. So um, Facebook, now uh, Meta, if you believe that it's a country, uh, they will have around 700 million inhabitants that use every day um, Facebook. Twitter is more or less the same. Amazon is pervading uh, the commerce all over the world and also polluting the world. And they are selling other kind of services. You have Netflix that uh, is capable to uh, provide you the series that you like at the moment you, you want. Uh, you have artificial intelligence in the stock markets. Uh, now and, and, and then you have that uh, uh, the use of AI in the stock market is more pervasive. Of course, New York stock market uh, is uh, only allowing 30% of all the exchange uh, ruled by AI. You have CD, Alexa, and all these kind of services that are there uh, to serve you ways. Uh, you have uh, AI programs that are working uh, all the time in uh, supporting the decision in, uh, in uh, legal courts, in uh, justice courts in the United States. And there is no single aspect of our actual industry that has not a program that the user or the owner claims that is using AI. But in medicine is also one of the most characteristic fields where you will find a, an AI program. Um, let me just give you a hint at what's happening, for example, with Alexa or, or Siri or one of those uh, bottlers, electronic bottlers that you can have. So when you talk to one of those uh, servers, uh, it will be a very small part of the process that will be processed in situ. Most of the information will travel through the internet to somewhere in the United States. It will be processed, uh, stored and aggregated, and the answer will be back to you immediately. And of course, this is very, uh, it's, it's magic because in within seconds, uh, your orders are accomplished. But we have to think uh, in the expenditure of resources we are having, because you are, we are using the network, we are uh, spending electricity here because you have uh, connected your Alexa, you have plenty of servers uh, where this information is stored. You have a lot of processors that will be crunching the information and you will have the information back immediately. So uh, it's clear that uh, those services are not very friendly with the environment and no one uh, really believes or questions how much it costs, I have this answer. And of course, uh, the procedure is very expensive, but because your data is part of the deal, so you are given for free your data, they are shaping better the profile of you and the people like you or like me everywhere. Uh, that's the, the way they, they make money. They make money using your information in a transparent way because you are not even thinking about it. Uh, it's just you want to, your genius give you something, uh, buy something, uh, open a door, whatever you, you are ordering. Uh, and then in return, have a better information about you. So it's clear that the information is, um, is the basis of all this business. And the most important thing is that this is, it is persistent. So the information I am giving them will be stored forever or a processed way of that information will be stored forever in someone else uh, servers, uh, and we don't know why. 
And if it is sell it or resell it to third parties, you are unaware of that. And of course, the, uh, the revenue you are getting is, uh, is not for you. So we can tell uh, or think uh, like the Beatles that AI is here, there and everywhere. And basically what we are creating is a new kind of jail that goes with us everywhere. So we, the only way to be out of the, of the trap is to close the, the interaction with the digital world. And it has the, the good sides, right? So you can uh, uh, plan a trip, uh, you, you can, <clears throat> sorry, one second. <clears throat> You can buy tickets, air tickets, hotels, restaurants, whatever you want, only using your, your mobile. And all these interactions are mediated through AI. So it makes uh, now the world run and we will find it everywhere. That's very important for, for AI technology. But what we have is that uh, uh, exactly we have um, a lot of uh, information related with AI that is not correct. So let us talk about some lies about AI. Machine learning using neural networks will soon make computers mimic humans. Well, it's not the it's not the objective, and of course, uh, neural nets are far from achieving the complexity of a human brain. Is what we know today, but you have also things like this. Intel is uh, presenting this uh, chip and you see the size. It's a real size photo where you have 1 million neurons uh, for that. So that's a, a neuromorphic chip that will have 1 million neurons and they claim that each one of the neurons has plenty of connections with other neurons. So maybe we are far, but maybe we are in the way to create machines that are as complex as a brain and may have uh, a large, very large number of neurons that will be interconnected. Maybe we don't know exactly the pathways to, to do it, but we are creating the architectures that support new ways of computing that will allow uh, AI to develop in a faster way uh, for ourselves. Right? And of course, to having 1 million uh, neurons in a chip like that, just give you the idea of the powerful computers you will have in the future in a very small um, size uh, with a very low uh, expenditure of energy. And of course, it will be needing uh, aside um, a lot of memory. But if you think that uh, the new iPhone 13 uh, can be bought with one tera uh, of disk, soon we will have more and more larger this uh, associated with faster chips and then the complexity of the tasks you can have on, on your telephone will be enormous. So it's true, we are far away from mimic the, the human brain, but we are in the path. Just as Professor Mateo Valero yesterday said, uh, the transistor was just invented uh, back in 1943. So it was, it's not even 100 years and we are uh, in having these kind of chips that are really amazing. <clears throat> um, artificial intelligence can defeat humans. Well, not really. Uh, machines plus humans can defeat a single human. Yes, that's more true. But of course, we all remember this uh, day uh, at least uh, the elders uh, in in uh, in the audience will remember this moment when Deep Blue defeated uh, the world champion chess Kari Kasparov, uh, and that was the really first time a machine was able to be programmed in a very specific task to defeat uh, a human, the, the best one in that specific uh, task. That is playing uh, chess. But of course, you can improve. And now we have machines that are able to defeat uh, the world champion on playing Go. 
uh, so we are not really um, telling that the machine is better than humans, but for a specific task with a lot of effort and plenty of information from humans, we were able until very recently to program machines to, for a specific task, defeat uh, humans. Since the last five or six years, now we can program machines to achieve a task and learn the task without having humans on board to teach or to even to, to show which were the rules of the, of the game. And they struck the rules just by um, interaction uh, or replaying the, the actions millions of times. Of course, that's not very good with the environment, but uh, we, we can do that. So it's not the goal to defeat or to replace uh, humans. Is the, the main idea is to use machines to support the task that humans do every day. But we can do also these specific things for uh, very well marketing um, products like uh, playing chess and automatically playing chess. <clears throat> what about this idea that you need huge investment uh, to, to create the new artificial intelligence? Well, it's clear that not every AI requires Google size investments. That's true. But if you want to get the size of Google, you need uh, a lot of money. And, and let me show you this, that is uh, the world Top regions for AI startups. And that's give you an idea of the interest of investment in AI. So the source of this um, um, this study is uh, now one year old, uh, but more or less the um, the sizes and the and the tendency is the same as of course. You see that we have three blocks. Uh, North America, uh, Europe, including Israel, and a growing um, region that will be China, uh, Australia, and India. And that, that will be really the new uh, frontier for, for AI. Uh, and we will be playing the game in the startups. So startups erupt in the in the field, the big companies tend to buy them to grow larger and larger and larger. So uh, maybe the, uh, the thing is that you have to keep investing in AI. And that's a very important message. If you are not investing in AI, you will be only buying products from the regions that are investing in that. And the, this, even uh, if you try to start late, there will be an opportunity. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so if you see, uh, this is the world leading artificial intelligence companies. You will see in this uh, picture two new ones, Alphabet and Meta. I had to update this, uh, this uh, image. And it's very interesting because uh, in here, I'm, I'm not forgetting the companies that are uh, in, in Asia, right? You have AI Brain, you have Samsung, I do Tencent. So uh, more and more, uh, we will see in the um, in the landscape of AI and the investment that there are companies that coming from elsewhere in in the world. There is no none from Europe, for example, in this big uh, landscape. And of course, uh, these guys are making small products and create a very large um, menu of tools that will be um, serving you. This one that is the one of the li possible list of Alphabet AI tools and only those that are using machine learning. So <clears throat> if you are a, a Google uh, user, you have to know that they are aggregating all the information that you are producing uh, using those tools, from reading your email uh, to watch uh, or to to process your images, uh, 
to see how you write when you type your emails uh, or you use Google Translate. It's everything that they, that they are doing for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you edit uh, images, all the things that they are learning from you and from everyone that uses that. And that's the, the richness. So the, it's not that they are creating that for free because they are uh, very good guys. They are doing this uh, to make profit and learn from the interaction. And that's very important. Learning from the interaction is not only the personal data, but also what I do when I interacting with the computer. The larger is the time I'm spending using those tools, the better I'm profiled by the tools. So <clears throat> why to invest in AI? So that's uh, the number of patents that were created. Uh, that's uh, an old figure, sorry, because I was unable to, to get a new one. But you see how AI is uh, growing uh, all over the world. Uh, if you see in Europe, the number of patents is very small uh, in uh, in US compared with the uh, with China that are the two in the bottom. You see that the Chinese are moving fast, and of course those are the patents that are uh, public. We don't know what's going on internally, things that they have, and they are not ready to be patented not to attract the interest of other companies. So there's also a lot of strategy in this, but you see that there is plenty of money. And when uh, this image also reflects the patents that are in use, not, on, not all the patents that were filled, but only those that are in use. And well, the, the differences are incredible. So uh, this is just to insist that we have to invest in science. AI is just uh, engineering discipline uh, that is involved in, uh, in giving support to science. And uh, of course, we, we need to invest in science. Countries with, are not investing in science are losing the, the sprint to the future and the past uh, COVID experience or still running COVID experience shows the way um, science is important, and but not only science, is the way the uh, the leaders of each country were using their scientific knowledge in order not only to produce the the vaccines, but also the way they apply the policy to to create the conditions uh, to allow uh, larger survival of their population, and well, you know who were the ones that uh, were losing more people because their politicians were not acting uh, immediately fast and following the uh, scientific advices. Huh? And well, the, the numbers are there, you, uh, there are not more need to say, but what is important is that uh, in less than two years, we were able to create not one, but many vaccines uh, to be used to fight against uh, COVID. Of course, AI was behind most of those vaccines because they were um, supporting the researchers there. No? It's not, I'm not claiming that AI was uh, the only, but was an important player in this one. So <clears throat> in countries like Mexico, it's very important uh, to invest in science because even if there has been small amount of uh, investment, the investment do not correspond with the uh, economy of, of, the, of this country. And we have to, to consider that uh, all the problems like the pandemics that are really monsters um, need silver bullets to be defeated. And science, in this case, vaccination and hygienic measures are there to support um, to support the humanity to do that. Uh, it's really strange to, to remind that after 200 years of uh, clinicians telling us, uh, you have to wash your hands, uh, we needed the pandemics to really create a, uh, an habit in the whole population that you have to, to wash hands. So 
one of the problems of these very powerful tools in science is that you have to control uh, the implications of the use of the scientific results. And uh, of course, uh, we want to write papers, but we want to create relevant science. That means science that has results, scientific results that are transferred to society. But before we do this transfer, we have to be sure that there are no side effects that can affect uh, either individuals or the environment. And that's very important that we have uh, to have in mind that it's not maybe one single result or one single tool won't really affect the whole population, but it may be the combination of two or more of those that uh, may change the course of the, of the original purpose. And there is a warning, no? science brings prosperity and prosperity bring votes, uh, but this is a long-term bet. This is the warning is for the politicians. No? So we need you invest in science, but you have to know that science is not uh, a department in Amazon Prime. If you look for a vaccine for the next epidemics, it won't be here the day after. Uh, you, you need to start thinking about the new problems uh, and start doing science today, not tomorrow. Uh, maybe better uh, starting yesterday than, than today. So <clears throat> why to invest in artificial intelligence in Mexico and how, why to regulate its use? Well, AI is, as I've been showing, a very powerful bullet and it is really making the difference in the development of countries. Uh, even uh, in the way we are framing the new relations, uh, AI is a uh, principal actor. Uh, you just see the effect on uh, of uh, social media uh, in uh, you know young people and the way they spend using the social media uh, and the number of books they read compared with the previous generation. That that that's make uh, a great change. So the thing is that we have to regulate AI because if not, it will produce monsters. Just to give you an idea of the effects, um, uh, three or four weeks ago, China forbid that youngsters, teenagers, and kids use more than three hours in a week uh, video games. And that's a real prohibition. So you cannot use. Uh, your video game more than three hours if you are uh, a minor. That's really uh, an effective measure to avoid people uh, not doing their normal things of uh, their age. That is playing the streets, making sport, uh, talking to other people, uh, reading, etc. What it could happen if we do that in in Western countries or the democratic countries? It will be Consider it as a tyrannic and non undemocratic uh, attitude. But they said, well, maybe that's affecting too much to our society. So we have to uh, to find the, the way in order to regulate using not only the ethical part, but also the legal, the socioeconomical, the cultural, and the gender aspects of the use of technologies. Because if not, we can uh, we can end. In a in a place like is like is now internet is an unregulated place where everything can happen, and uh, because that because the media is now internet and we are not regulating in the appropriate way the internet we are having very complicated um, <coughs> dreams created so to say so. The European Union uh, is trying to regulate AI. In the same way, they were first trying to create rules for the protection of uh, personal data. Now, the European Union is uh, first mover in AI regulation. And of course, it has been like a domino. Uh, it had, has, at the very beginning, the opposition of the 
big companies and of course the small medium companies in Europe because they claim that if you regulate AI innovation will be stopped. But we have to ask ourselves that innovation is good at any price. The only big element of this new regulation is that you have to apply researchers and engineers to think first before they before doing something that you can do, but maybe you don't have the means to uh, prove that it won't be uh, harmful for society or for the environment. So it's very important that we bring as our researchers this idea, uh, not only to ourselves, but also to the new generations in our universities, because education will be the tool to allow uh, a more uh, ethical uh, design for the new tools of the future, not only in artificial intelligence, but in many other fields. Uh, in uh, pharmacy, pharmacy that has been really regulated since 40 years, but ITs are not so well regulated, so we, it's, it is the time. Of course, uh, one can claim that if we waste time uh, understanding the regulation or understanding the, the means, it will be very late for us, and it may be the case that it happened like that, but uh, also it's better that society really understands the uses of technology than the only users. We prefer people have a clear idea of which are the purpose of the, um, of the technology they have in, on hand. <clears throat> it's ridiculous to understand or to know that everyone can have access to um, a telephone, a mobile telephone that, uh, could be a, the fastest supercomputer only 15 or 20 years ago. There will be countries uh, unable to buy the power of computing power that you have on your mobile today. And uh, people is not really aware of the power of that uh, tool that they have on hand. So it's better to, to make an education step ahead. So, <clears throat> Which is the future horizon? Well, uh, now the the future horizon is 2050, and we know that one of the first uh, elements is robotics, right? So AI plus robotics are changing the the face of the research and the market. So um, it's clear that when uh, people talk about autonomous cars or trucks or airplanes, we are talking about robots that have a new purpose that will be uh, helping you to move from one place to another. Mobility will be uh, not anymore um, uh, be uh, created for non-robots because robots will be uh, in a way optimal or more um, appropriate to optimize uh, its use in, in the cities that are already collapsing, right? So everybody uh, is doing that. Alibaba, Alphabet, that was Google, Amazon, IBM, Meta, Microsoft, all they are uh, investing heavily in AI. So <clears throat> the, uh, if you add the investment of Google, Facebook, uh, and AI, uh, IBM, it's almost comparable with the investment of the whole European Union in AI. So that's for giving you an idea of the interest, right? Um, we have a rotunary use of machine learning and deep learning as a sub part of machine learning to, uh, uh, to be embedded in tools that do speech recognition, machine translation, robotic control, risk management, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. So the new AI is preparing us to be in a digital world. The digitalization will be the real effect of AI uh, in the near future. And uh, not so far from now in 2025, the value of AI will be, the revenue will be 50 billion euros for AI. What about Mexico? Well, 
all that is very good news because there will be plenty of market, there will, there's plenty of opportunities. And in the AI, uh, Mexico has a, used to have a very strong community and Mexico has a national strategy for AI. Now, the question is how it will be implemented, right? And as a matter of fact, Mexico was uh, portrayed as a, uh, a, a first mover in creating a, a strategy for AI for the country. So, well, it's not bad, but we have to, or Mexico has to, to do it appropriately to, to, to be a leader in the region, right? So, to conclude, let's uh, let us uh, let me address my proposal. So, I believe that the first step is to regulate and promote digital education for kids. We cannot lose a new generation. But the only way to do that is to educate teachers. If uh, teachers are not educating kids in digital elements, uh, the kids will never learn because their parents are uh, digital illiterate. So we need uh, that AI specialists and robotic specialists do the job to educate teachers and kids for the first. We have to promote STEAM uh, among girls. So we cannot uh, be a rich country if the half of the population is not participating in uh, promoting technology and science. Uh, we need long-term projects. Uh, science is not made in one, one day to another. You need uh, critical mass and you need good funding and also long-term funding. So you, once you write your proposal, you have very large period to, to do this. And, and of course, at the end, you, you need to be audited and you have to, to be accountable for, for the money you are receiving uh, from the state. And uh, of course, uh, we need as a country to record the pulse, the pulse of international cooperation. That's why these conferences are very important. We need to talk with the, uh, other people doing the same things as we are doing and interchange opinions. I hope the next uh, edition of this, con this conference will be in person. Uh, but if you are not working with other people in other countries, you will never get the critical mass needed to, to do uh, excellent science. And of course, talent knows no frontiers and you have to be inclusive and bring people from other countries to your own institutions. Uh, and that will imply a lot of changes. Uh, uh, it may be, you can be afraid of change, but uh, it will be really exciting and we need to, to change. So many thanks for hearing me. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much, Ulysses, for your work very very interesting presentation now i'd like to open the floor to see if there are any questions either via youtube or um facebook or meta or um the floor in the meantime i would like to ask you if uh i mean in terms of artificial intelligence and geospatial data uh what do you see coming in the next say five or 10 years in terms of relationship between geospatial data and artificial intelligence? Well, um, there is a part of AI that is flooded with data. The most data you have, uh, the, date, uh, the, the better will be your results for that kind of AI. Not all AI is based on data. So it will depend on the field of, uh, of application. Okay. There's two things that are true. Uh, we have larger uh, capacity of storage. We have larger capacity of uh, processing, but the bottleneck will be in accessing uh, the data. So if you have very large this, uh, to will be very complicated to, to extract data. So one of the things that is happening now is that, uh, let's say in high performance computing, what you are doing is to have uh, the very large replication of this with the same data. So every processor can access to, to the same, let's say, 
data, but accessing to different portions of the disk in order not to stop the procedure and, and avoid bottlenecks. So um, uh, the, the main thing I believe for the future is will be to forget about this notion of big data and uh, go to a new uh, religion that will be only using the appropriate data. So that means that the curation of the data will be larger, but the quality will be better. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, let me see. We have another question here that uh, it's more related to uh, the country itself. And it says, uh, what would be, what do you suggest would be an appropriate first step towards legislation uh, on uh, artificial intelligence in Mexico? The first one? Um, yeah. no, uh, the first one is uh, to regulate the all the public data. So we citizens are producing a lot of data. Most of the data uh, is stored in governmental databases. So it should be good that the, there is a central authority that is the owner of the data and is clearly uh, identified who is the responsible for the use of the data, that there are clear um, uses of the data, how long it can be um, stored, uh, when it should be uh, deleted, and then uh, also regulate on the special uh, types of data like uh, biometric data or digital identity. That's the first step. The second step is to to create sandboxes where the uh, governmental authorities can test uh, the program before they go into the market. I always explain, and that's very all the ones that hear me before. I, I always say that if uh, Facebook, instead of being a social media, had to be a vaccine, it will never be on, online because it was never tested uh, in a, the appropriate way. So all the things that we are facing today with Facebook is that there was no uh, the idea of testing in a, let's say, regulated laboratory for, for doing that. So, the, the country needs to, to approve some boxes in order to try all the technology that comes from, from outside and only approve the use of uh, those algorithms that are tested and certified by the Mexican government or an alliance with other governments in Latin America or elsewhere. So you may agree with Europe to, to share this, uh, this legislation. And that, that's the, the thing, uh, how to, to go towards uh, global legislation. As a matter of fact, Mexico participates in, uh, in a group that is called Global Partnership for, for Artificial Intelligence that is uh, under the umbrella of the UN, United Nations. And uh, there, all these aspects of uh, governance of AI and its regulation are discussed and well, they will be uh, implemented, we hope, for the all, all OCD countries. So there is a step, but Mexico has to create their own regulation. The first thing is that Mexico has to acknowledge that AI is important for the development of the country and also may be dangerous to be dependent from other uh, countries' technology. And let, okay. me, let, me, let me one yeah. more. And you have to get uh, big companies like Google, Amazon, and all these to pay the taxes in Mexico. That's very important. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much for that answer. There's another question here. Uh, do you have any recommendations for techniques and best practices that, to create data sets? Uh, it's a very open question, but if you have any pointers in particular data sets towards Maybe artificial intelligence. Well, um, there is two uses of uh, good data sets, uh, data sets. First, to avoid bias in the data. So 
the first recommendation is don't use public data if you are unable to test the quality of the data. So one of the largest uh, disasters we are creating is that we create libraries of, I don't know, neural networks, put it public, and we create data sets that are also public. And people that is unable to understand what's going on with the program and the quality of the data uses the, uh, the programs that are online and the data that is online, they just run it in a machine and create results that are, of course, biased and are unfair and have all the problems. So creation of data is the most important part. So I believe that it should be an effort to create all the public data sets in order to make them uh, really useful for the development of science. So the first is create data. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question here that reads, um, what is your opinion on all these uh, like um, data challenges and hackathons and things like that in terms of uh, like lies or myths and realities of artificial data and lots of people putting a lot of effort in these challenges, very short uh, time to challenges uh, and whatever can be produced from those challenges. And someone might be, uh, you know, uh, own, uh, claiming ownership of those things because yeah, they pay for so it. That, that, that's that's very complicated. So hackathon uh, um, are good uh, by definition. Again, the problem will be the use and the uh, legal status of each one of them. And um, um, you don't know. For example, I I know I'm aware that uh, there are new hackathons uh, using AI for uh, processing genetic data from human samples. Well, uh, of course, uh, I assume that there is a, a legal frame, a legal frame that is shaping uh, the way the data is dealt with, and the data won't be, let's say, moving away. But also, uh, all the results go to a, a GitHub that is. Um, public again and, and belongs to a company, of course, because GitHub is not anymore, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an NGO, but is sold by a company. So they now have the access to all those codes that are, let's say, created by public and, let's say, uh, altruistic interaction. And now maybe if the code is good, uh, a taken profit by company. So that it's weird, at least it's weird. You have to be very careful with those. When well controlled and well shaped, they are very good because uh, we expect uh, computer scientists and other um, scientists are, are altruistic uh, and participate in those. But again, uh, the use is important. Is the well use of things is need to be uh, framed it in the appropriate way. Okay, great, yeah, perfect, thank you very much. So I think we don't have any more questions right now from the floor, so I would like to thank you again, Ulysses, for this great talk and very inspiring and interesting topics. And I would like to thank everyone right now and we will make a short break and we'll return at 9.45 uh, for our oral session <clears throat> number four. And so we'll see you shortly. Thank you all. Thank you, bye-bye.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, good morning, and thank you for attending this oral session. Before starting our presentations, I would like to remind all of our presenters that they will have 15 minutes plus five minutes of questions and answers at the end, if there are any. Please bear in mind that there are volunteers roaming around the virtual floor who can assist you, and you can write your questions in the chat box uh, to be read out loud. They will be forwarded to the staff members and moderators. Uh, for those who are following the transmission via streaming, please enter your questions in the streaming service chat box as well. And presenters, please be aware that uh, you will be addressed with the sound alert when you have five minutes left, so you can start wrapping up your presentation. Okay. Uh, and our first presenters in this session are Edali Murillo, Marisol Palomar Ramirez, and Mariana Ramos Flores. Who will be talking about the assessment on the on the distribution and accessibility to green spaces in Mexico's most populated metropolitan zones? So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rodrigo. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We present our work entitled Assessment on the Distribution and Accessibility to Green Spaces in Mexico's Most Populated Metropolitan Zones. Our team is made up of Mariana Ramos, Marisol Palomar, and myself, Edali Murillo. Okay, uh, the project's main goal it's to conduct an assessment on the distribution and accessibility to green spaces in Mexico's 10 most populated metropolitan zones to generate information useful to decision makers and thereby influence sustainable, sustainable socio-ecological territorial planning and social inclusion policies. In order to conduct this project, we raise the following six questions concerning to the structure and content of this presentation. First, which population groups have better access to green zones? Second, if access is unequal, is there inequality in every context? Third, at a micro level, is there any difference between green zones if they are located in an area of more or less poverty in regard to their urban fittings? Fourth, within parks, does every person have the same infrastructure need to access to green zones? Fifth, which is the necessary infrastructure so that the disadvantaged population can access to green zones? And finally, if more parks are added to a metropolitan zones, by how much inequality decreases? Let's begin. The first question is, which population groups have better access to green zones? To, ask, to answer this question, the first concept we review is that of environmental justice. Environmental justice refers to the fair distribution of ecosystemic services and their associated benefits. The environmental and economic crisis, ecological and, econ and economic costs are distributed in unequally. People with scarce resources are the worst hit by the economic changes and the environmental impacts is, was of, is one of the consequences most hurting to them. Environmental justice is the right to a safe, healthy, and productive environment in which the environment is regarded overall in its ecological, physical, built, social, political, aesthetic, and economic dimensions. We began, the next please. Uh, we began with the fact that urban development is not and has never been homogeneous. Cities perpetuate and replicate inequalities. These inequalities have spawned historically vulnerable populations since there is a great diversity in individual needs, spaces are lived and experienced differently. Cities must consider, consider at least the following aspects in its inhabitants, sexual identity, age, origin, class, social, origin, social class, functional diversity, and physical capabilities. We must plan cities with layouts that ease autonomous mobility, safety, nearby services, and spaces that prioritize communal coexistence. Urban spaces contribute to confuse the reality in which city dwellers live. In, in, the, in this slide, we look uh, at the four population groups that we focus. It's girls and boys from six to 11 years old, second women 15 to 59 years old, 
third adults over 60 years of age, and the last people with a disability like motor, visual, visual and auto, auto, auditory or other. Now we can look at the city of Monterrey. This map shows how the vulnerable population is distributed, is classified as low, medium, and highly vulnerable population. population. The second map shows the population density. These maps were made with the intention of seeing the dynamics of people within the study cities. Afterward, the, the following question that guided our research was, in every context, we can see the same unequal axis. We for we suggest the following hypothesis. Is there, are, there is a relationship between belonging to a certain socioeconomic stream and accessibility to cultural ecosystemic services that furnish green areas, since in Mexican cities, the poorer areas show less accessibility to urban green areas. To undertake the first analysis, we downloaded data from OSM, uh, INEGI, and CONEVAL in order to investigate how poverty and green zones are distributed especially. Our first area of study were Mexico's 10 most populated metropolitan zones, zones since being cities, they suffer from major environmental and urban planning problems. As initial results, we have this map of Mexico Valley metropolitan zone, in which we see that ahebs with high poverty levels have fewer green zones, ahebs colored in that dark brown. This pattern is also, is also visible uh, in the Guadalajara metropolitan zone, where ahebs uh, with high poverty levels have a uh, few green zones. So to measure accessibility to green zones, uh, we presently uh, follow, follow this procedure. We first estimated the ahebs and green zone centroids. Then we estimated the areas of green zones closest to each ahead. And finally, we est this estimate uh, was divided by the distance uh, from the ahead to uh, green areas squared. We later estimated the Gini coefficient. So to obtain a measurement of the buildup uh, in the access to green zones, in order to compare environmental justice within metropolitan zones. This coefficient, coefficient was assessed by measuring the area below the population accruement curve and uh, access to green zones. These results, uh, the results of this coefficient show that, most unequal, that the most unequal cities are Puebla Tlaxcala in the central region, Guadalajara in the west and La Laguna in the north, north, northern region. Uh, in regard uh, to comparing the access to urban green zones and poverty, we found heavily unequal access uh, and in the context, for example, uh, Puebla Tlaxcala. Context in dark green uh, show low poverty levels and high accessibility levels, and conversely, in orange, uh, high poverty levels and low accessibility levels. We also saw context with low access unequally, uh, since we see few ahebs in orange. However, in, this envir in, the, in the environs, we also see high uh, poverty, low accessibility context. This outcome was probably obtained because uh, Puebla, uh, Ciudad Juarez is an a desert city and the, thus the overall population cannot access to any green zone easily. Finally, we found context wherein ahebs were painted in reverse colors in which there is a high uh, accessibility and high poverty levels and low accessibility and low poverty levels. The same situation in Toluca. So since people there have high access to green zones and, and below to green zones and belong to a low socioeconomic class, we can uh, raise the, this question. To what sort of green zones do these people go to? And is there any difference between green areas if they are located in a richer or poorer area in regard to urban equipment? The second hypothesis says, the relation of poverty and inclusive infrastructure. The urban green areas present in the poorest areas of the city are those, those with the least inclusive infrastructure. Uh, we had analysis at the park level from socioeconomic inequality. 
In the first picture, we can see the Benito Juarez Park on the right, which is located at a high economic level. On the left side is the Zócalo de Huajotzingo, located in a low income area. With both photos, we can make a visual analysis that compares infrastructure, infrastructure conditions in each park. The red circle shows the deteriorated, deteriorated conditions of the sidewalk. Instead, the park on the right was remodeled in 2018. Now, now we now we see that the park on the left doesn't have ramp for the people who use who use a wheelchair and in Benito Juarez Park there are ramps although the signs need to be improved. The next now we see the territorial order related to public transport. In the photo below there is a space dedicated exclusively to a public transport, while in the other photo the public space is shared by private cars, pedestrians, and buses. In the last photo. It's observed that the wood area differs significantly between both parks. The park located in the Avedra residential area has better conditions with respect to green areas. Uh, the second topic under study is at the local level. We select six parks in three quick in equal metropolitan zones. Radar graphs were used to compare quality and access that this park ensure or not. Lines can be read from outside, outside to inside. The green dotted line represents the area park in regard to infrastructure. Best equipped concerning the variable we have determined. In the case of Puebla Tlaxcala, the dark line points at the green dotted line, which is the park in a half with low poverty, and the clear line points at the center is the least favorite park. The pattern described above is repeated in the city of Guadalajara on the next slide, where the dark line reflects better conditions in the park with a higher socioeconomic level. Uh, another example is observed in the city of La Laguna. This, the, this city shows the worst condition between the three cities studied. After observing the differences between parks, the following question arises. Does every person have the same need for infrastructure to access to green zones? Next, please. To answer this, we are grounded in Maple Wands and colleagues' concept of accessibility, which define this uh, as an attribute regarding to the ease with which one can reach certain places. We propose two scales to analyze accessibility. On the one hand, the simpler scale is uh, either the presence of physical connections or the degree of physical separation between two points. On the other hand, the most complex is the one that determines uh, accessibility in contrast with, with the urban milieu and the individual's specific autonomy in space and time. Considering the access to urban opportunities is different for people of different, different genders and age. Next, please. In this case, we consider the needs of the elderly, people with different capabilities, girls, boys, and women. The next step was to conduct an exploration of recent images at the street level in each one of the parks under study. Next, please. We observed that in most cases, infrastructure associated to the road network is either insufficient or derelict, which hinders and conditions safe and autonomous traffic for disadvantaged people. Next, please. Scale analysis of parks consists in adding values for every infrastructure layer needed for safe circulation. Thus, uh, through map algebra method, five variables were added, namely sidewalks, wooded paths, ramps for the disabled, public library, and stores. These variables were obtained upon reviewing accessibility and inclusive urban design bibliographic sources. Next, please. Later on, two parks from three metropolitan zones with the highest Gini coefficient were chosen, and results were compared with that a park located in a poverty-stricken zone and with another from a less poor zone. From the values obtained, the streets were classified according to their fittings, and a semaphore scale indicated low accessibility in red, mid medium in yellow, and high accessibility in green. Spanning from streets within a radius of 700 meters uh, from each park centroid at a walking distance of 10 minu minutes at a speed of 4 kilometers per hour. In this map, uh, in the upper part, we can see uh, uh, street accessibility in Puebla Tlaxcala metropolitan zone in the poorest urban zone. 
and in the at the lower part uh, the park in the least poor area so we can see a higher number of streets in red within uh, the poorest area next please concerning the guadalajara metropolitan zone the result was qui quite similar since we can observe more streets in red uh, in the upper part of the map and more accessibility at the lower part in the least poor areas next please Finally, La Laguna Metropolitan Zone also show more accessible parks in the less poor neighborhoods since they have more inclusive urban infrastructure in the highway network. Next, please. Finally, in regard, um, we wanted to know that uh, if we add more green zones to a metropolitan zone, it is possible to change the levels of environmental justice. Uh, in, we, in regard to the simulator, uh, we selected the metropolitan zone of Querétaro since it is a city uh, with a high uh, Gini coefficient. In the, uh, in the metal, uh, simulator methodology, new areas were manually added in those ahead uh, that were found in the environs. The results show a lower Gini coefficient. In a nutshell, we can see that under certain conditions, are adding green zones improves environmental justice within in metropolitan zones. An analysis of the results allow us to prove our hypothesis of whether in Mexican cities, tenets of environmental justice are complied with or not. Next, please. In the first place, the results of comparing accessibility and poverty were shown through bivariate maps, which suggest a relationship between both variables, namely that the poorest areas in Mexican cities show the least accessibility to urban parks. Moreover, a common pattern among metropolitan zones was seen in which squalor and lack of access to public services worsening human settlements located at the city's environs. Next, please. Secondly, results show a possible relationship between poverty and the presence of inclusive infrastructure as proven by the scale analysis of the parks and nearby access through fairs. This allows us to conclude that access to urban green areas is lower in the poorest zones due to the lack of infrastructure and mostly affects safe and autonomous mobility for socially disadvantaged groups. The spaces have not been suitable planned or cared for, despite the quite diverse benefits we get from them. On the other hand, urban green spaces tend to exist only a small isolated island, restricting, restricting their advantage in, term of, in terms of bio biodiversity conservation. Therefore, it's crucial that we improve their quantity as well as their quality so that, that the people can access to all their benefits. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Dali, Marisol, and Mariana, for your presentation. Congratulations to all of you. And I would like to, well, we have a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any, uh, from the public or from the uh, streaming services. If anyone has any question, please raise your, raise your hand, write it on the chat box, or come up front. Okay, so we have a chat, uh, sorry, a question here in the chat box, which, which reads, there are some studies in the U.S. which correlate the presence of green areas with neighborhoods of white people. The results suggest that the racism is the reason for that. Here in Mexico, is there any correlation with the racism or it could be only for the socioeconomical status? Okay, um, we, we only analyzed uh, the relation between uh, socioeconomical uh, variables, but uh, in, in a personal experience, I think is a, a relation between um, 
the race and the socioeconomic level in Mexico. Uh, we um, we uh, read an article, an article uh, in which uh, the authors uh, mentioned that uh, there is a park that uh, we show in Guadalajara Metropolitan Zone. And it was interesting because um, they say that um, the, they um, make a, a, a demand because uh, people of indigenous origin was in this park. And uh, then uh, they discovered that this park uh, was um, um, visited uh, for people that make the the level of of clean the houses the rich houses around okay great thank you very much for that answer um so we are just we're finishing up this session thank you very much and we will move on to our next presenter uh, which is Jose Luis Silvan Cárdenas with the paper titled uh, Geospatial Analysis of Clandestine Graves in Baja California, New Approaches for the Search of Missing Persons in Mexico. Jose Luis, please. Thank you, Rodrigo, and good morning, everyone. Hope you, are, you all are enjoying this, uh, this conference. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something different uh, from what we have heard so far, but hope uh, this is not uh, so uh, so uh, strenuous to you. Uh, the title is Geospatial Analysis of Clandestine Graves in Baja California, New Approaches for the Search of Missing Persons in Mexico. And I like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, Ana Alegre from Centro Geo and Jorge Ruiz Reyes from Data Civica, who uh, I think will be listening here today. Um, the, <clears throat> the work is uh, around Baja California Norte, which is a bordering state to the United States. Um, and it has a megalopolis, Tijuana, San Diego, which is located in the northwest corner of the state. And this state has been, um, um, you know, uh, th there has been a lot of disputes between cartels, especially the Beltran Leyva cartel and also the, uh, the cartel, Jalisco Nueva Generación and Sinaloa cartel. So there, there has been a, a struggling in the control of space in this in this area because it's a um, it's a it's an access to the market in the United States basically and um, uh, to give you some numbers the Tijuana ranked second in homicides between 2011 and 2021 so that represented 8.5 percent of national um, homicides and between 2006 and 2021 there were there were reports of uh, missing people of around 1000 over 1000 and just in this year between february 19 and june 21 the national commission for search of disappeared people commission nacional de busqueda um, have conducted uh, some search rounds, 59 so far, or at least within this period of time, and it, which is the eighth uh, place nationally. I mean, there is a lot of attention to this state right now and to some other states in the Northern uh, border. So it was the third worst state in terms of impunity rates between Six, uh, 2016 and 2018. So this is the, the context uh, of this state. And um, just want to point out that the, the map shows some, some points, which are the graves that have been discovered previously 
either by the National Commission or by some uh, organized groups, collectives of families of disappeared people. And those points um, basically are our main source of analysis here. So the points where these graves have been located be before. Um, so the previous work that is related to this, uh, this, this presentation was uh, presented two years ago in this conference in Merida. And the idea is very simple. It's, it's named clandestine, clandestine space, which is um, a concept that uh, assumes there are a couple of, of variables or dimensions, if you wish, that um, that define this clandestine clandestine space. Clandestine space is just uh, the conjunction of uh, high spatial accessibility and high spatial privacy. What are those things? Uh, these are uh, measures or measures of of um, how fast I can get to some place, uh, or and how private how, how private is it it is, and uh, the space. Um, the, the geographical space can be characterized in terms of these two of these two variables, and we use that, those to answer um, a hypothesis that the, the clandestine graves are more likely to be found in the clandestine space, which is um, in this in these two axes. It's uh, marked in the upper uh, in the upper right. Uh, and another concept that we used in this study was the spa spatial point pattern analysis, which you may already be familiar with because this is uh, typically used to detect clusters in point data. And uh, in particular, the replace case uh, correlation function L was used to determine uh, these clusters. And uh, as you will see in a moment, in a moment uh, this replace K function allows to, um, to determine the range of distances from a known grave uh, where we can uh, discover other graves. Uh, besides the point pattern analysis, we introduced a boundary model of the clandestine, uh, the clandestine space, uh, which as I mentioned before, it's uh, Characterized by two dimensions, the travel time from an urban settlement measures the accessibility, and the visibility index is just an uh, is just an index that measures the probability that a point is uh, seen by someone in the nearby, and this um, this accessibility in this in the index make uh, made use of um, of the so-called watershed view. Or water view, um, shed view, actually, shed view, which is um, a concept in GIS for uh, delineating the area that is um, that, that is visible from a point, basically. So using these two variables, the model is very simple, and you can see the equation there, uh, where A and V are just like weights. The, these are defined as maximum travel time in case the, the first one and the second one is the maximum visibility and n is just a, an exponent that I'll, I will show what's the effect of that exponent in a minute. So this is the equation and we say that uh, a point which some visibility and, and time uh, belongs to the clandestine space if it uh, complies with uh, a condition which is um, indicated in this in this inequality okay so with negative uh, values being the ones that are inside the clandestine space besides that we also use the grave coverage index which is a just a, a ratio between the number of known graves and the mold search area this is this can be thought as the measure of a expected number of graves that can be discovered by chance within within a model search search area. It may be also regarded as the measure of the cost benefit for a given model of the search area. So being the cost, the, the denominator, the model search area, because this gives us the size of the area that we need to search. 
And the numerator is the benefit, the number of known graves uh, gives us the number, a measure of the number of graves that we will expect to find in this, in this area. So <clears throat> to be more concrete, uh, uh, the clandestine space here in this map is delineated uh, and it's shown in, in pink color. You can see the pink color that is the clandestine space. Uh, and I can actually go to um, a live app that um, allows me to uh, move these parameters of, of the model I just showed you. And I hope this can load quick. Um, hope you can see this map now. And there is a scatter plot in the left that shows the, <clears throat> the clandestine space in terms of the two variables that I talked before. And the model, it's just this straight line with the exponent being uh, one. And if I change this uh, <clears throat> uh, this parameter, the, the n, um, <clears throat> actually, I, I, yeah, I changed that parameter. It just curved it. So the effect of that exponent that I mentioned before is just that the the um, the curvature of the of the boundary of the clandestine space and also map will change. Um, and so this is basically the clandestine space. The the points are just the, the where the graves have were located before. And um, yeah, thank you. So the way we integrated this uh, was just to intersect two layers. And I'm not going to get into much detail, but just tell you that this uh, the, the one, la one layer is the clandestine space mask, and the other ones, one was the range of distances that were acquired through the analysis of the point pattern. The point pattern analysis uh, allows to build this curve here, which is uh, basically the frequency where we get uh, new grays uh, from known data. And, and the, the, the gray here, the gray area is just assuming that if the point were random. So, so what this graph is telling you basically is that the, our point is not random and actually there is a, um, a range of distances where it is more likely that you can find this uh, uh, new graves, to, you can discover new graves. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this. Um, this is just uh, to optimize the parameters A B, and B using the GZ, the the grave coverage index that I introduced before. And uh, at the end, the, the finding was that we, once we optimize both the exponent, which is, uh, this was the optimal exponent, and the A and D parameters, which were 39, uh, this is in, in minutes, 39 minutes from the center of the urban center, and D59, uh, then we just need to optimize the, the rings uh, and we we found that the um, that the ring mask was um, actually had to be between 0.1 and um, 4, which had the highest GCI you can see here and here also. And so uh, I think that should be the one, the last one. Yeah. Um, so the previously proposed a clandestine space concept was advanced by providing an explicit model of the boundary and showing how to integrate information from the point pattern analysis of known grave locations. And we developed this online platform that to, uh, to, to fit the, the parameters of the model, of the boundary model, and to be able to also intersect these two different masks to reduce the, the area uh, down to 10% of the original area. So um, this, hopefully this will be uh, more useful to define a search area. So uh, I think um, there are some additional information here that um, uh, you can also consult. And thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Jose Luis, for your kind of presentation and actually for finishing right on time. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. that. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions from the audience here in the chat box or from anyone in the um, in the streaming service. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Oh, there's a question right there. Please come up. Uh, hold on, hold on. Sorry, someone had a question. Because I saw a hand down there, but just not wasn't there anymore. So <laughs> someone right. wanted to ask a question. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions at the moment. So thank you very much, Jose Luis, for your presentation. Um, thank you, Rodrigo. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. And we will move on to our next and final presentation of this session. Uh, which is the geopolitical repercussions of the migration rhetoric of uh, Donald Trump on Mexican anti-immigrant speech online, a transdisciplinary approach uh, by Tomá Catán. Tomá, please, the floor is yours. So are we waiting for the, the question or can I begin? Okay, uh, hello, hello everyone. My name is uh, Thomas Catin. I'm a PhD student at Centro Geo Mexico and the Institut Français de Géopolitique uh, in France. So I'm guessing everyone is seeing the presentation. So I'm uh, honored to be uh, able to present this uh, ongoing research project, which is a collaboration work with uh, three researchers from Centro Geo, uh, Dr. Alejandro Molinas, Molina Villegas, uh, Dr. Julieta Fuentes Carrera, and Dr. Oscar Gerardo Sanchez Siorni. So this uh, project, aims at building a transdisciplinary approach to analyze the geopolitical repercussions of U.S. anti-immigrant rhetoric on Mexican online speech about migration. So I always like to introduce the subject with this photograph where we can see the former mayor of Tijuana, a Mexican city at the U.S.-Mexico border, wearing a Make Tijuana Great Again cap derived from the, the Make America Great Again slogan used by Donald Trump during his political campaign. Uh, this photograph was taken while a large group of Central American mi migrants arrived in the city to ask for asylum in the U.S., prompting anti-immigrant reaction, especially visible online. So while Mexico has long defined itself as an immigration country, it has become a transit and immigration country due to recent trends in migration and U.S. policies. So the map you can see on screen details what we could call the, the geopolitical position of Mexico regarding migrations in the region. So the most important thing is that the Mexican territory is the main migratory territorial interface for clandestine migrations towards the United States. And for this reason, since uh, the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, the Mexican borders have become geostrategic externalization territories for the United States border control policies. Um, all while the clandestine migration, notably from Central America, increased, these policies have transformed the Mexican border and uh, more generally the Mexican territory into uh, a migratory buffer zone where large groups of migrants get trapped for several months waiting for the resolution of their migratory processes. 
So Mexico does not yet seem to have the actors and mechanisms favoring the emergence of intense and lasting anti-immigrant speech. However, expressions such as Make Tijuana Great Again or the hashtag Mexico Primero indicate some interiorization of American anti-immigrant rhetoric in Mexico. So such interiorization invites us to think about Mexican anti-immigrant speech not as a cultural, but as a geopolitical phenomenon, where the migratory situation in Mexico, a byproduct of US migration policies, and the electoral power struggle in the US have bolstered the online transnationalization of American anti-immigrant uh, speech. So there is two main objectives to this presentation. First, to uh, detail the approach used to build a convolutional neuronal network model able to detect anti-immigrant speech in geolocalized Mexican Spanish tweets and to present the preliminary results of said model. And second objective, to propose a transdisciplinary methodology based on the data obtained from the classification to verify the hypothesis that American anti-immigrant speech during Donald Trump's presidency has had a quantitative and qualitative impact on Mexican anti-immigrant speech. So my goal is not to give you an extensive review of the literature, but just to highlight specific points of particular importance for this project. First, that social media, and in particular Twitter, have imposed themselves as privileged media platform for verbal opposition, confrontation between user users, and especially on migration issues. Basically, Twitter is a pretty good place to find anti-immigrant speech. Uh, another essential takeaway is that uh, is the transnational aspect of the debate on social media. And finally, there is an overall interest from the social science perspective in studying anti-immigrant speech on social media. But this interest is sometimes limited by the techniques used to detect such a speech. So we argue that developing a classification model based on deep learning techniques can improve the detection of anti-immigrant speech and furthermore, the use of uh, geolocalized data from Twitter will enable us to isolate and analyze specifically the Mexican anti-immigrant speech. Uh, the recurrent presence of hate speech online has generated an interest in the automatic detection of this type of content by using natural language processing uh, technique. Recent works have demonstrated the uh, efficiency in uh, using uh, an, an approach based on a neuronal network to detect hate speech in English and in Spanish. Other research has focused on certain types of hate speech, such as misogyny. And even if the detection of anti-immigrant hate speech in Spanish, of uh, anti-immigrant yeah, anti hate speech in Spanish is of undeniable interest, uh, this domain is still vastly unexplored, so this project aims at building a model able to detect anti-immigrant speech in Spanish uh, in the Mexican territorial context. <clears throat> so in this first section, I will present the main steps we took to build the classification model. Uh, first, tweets published in Mexico between January 2017 and May 2021 were collected using the Automata Geointeligente and Internet, AGI, developed by CentroGeo. And once downloaded, the, the AG, AGI data was mapped in a GIS and reviewed by year, three months periods, and by region of publication. So uh, the map on screen is the one we use to regroup uh, the tweets. Um, as some of you probably know, the first step to build a supervised classification model is the most time-consuming one. For us, it is labeling a large number of tweets manually into our two classes that are anti-immigrant and not anti-immigrant. Uh, to speed up the process, uh, tweets extracted with AGI or obtained through the Twitter advanced uh, search were filtered by keywords, expressions, context, and users susceptible to uh, uh, anti-immigrant speech. The tweets were they uh, manually labeled according to five criteria. These criteria were elaborated from the geopolitical conceptualization of anti-immigrant speech. 
And for now, the criteria were qualitatively validated by a panel of experts, but we plan to measure statistically the uh, inter-rater agreement. This step is very important because it relates a lot with what Professor Ulysses said in the first presentation, that we need to have uh, quality data. And it's especially true for uh, neuronal networks. Uh, your model is going to be good only if your training data is good. So those criteria, it's a way to um, kind of object to have less subjectivity in the manual labeling process. So the training uh, data set was then used to train a convolutional neuronal network. So this is a technique primarily used in image processing, but applied to text, a CNN is very effective in applying successive filters to that reduce the entry vector's dimension while increasing also the effectiveness of finding text patterns. And this type of model have proven effective in uh, hate speech detection. Lastly, another important step was that the earliest classification was used as feedback for the training stage. Uh, the qualitative uh, revision of the classified data proved useful for adding negative and positive examples to the training data set by manually reclassifying false positives and false negative. It's also a good step to observe how your uh, model classify and to make uh, adjustments. So as you can see, the, the model still fails to detect a good portion of anti-immigrant tweets indicated by the uh, recall for the anti-immigrant class. And a substantial number of anti-immigrant tweets are classified as not anti-immigrant, indicated by the precision for the not anti-immigrant class. But there is a, a few ways we can improve the model. Uh, first and foremost, by increasing the training data set with both uh, anti-immigrant and not anti-immigrant tweets. Also by increasing the spatial representativity of the training data set. And finally, uh, ex by experimenting with the parameters of the model. In this la last uh, section, I would like to talk about how we can use the, the classified data to do a geopolitical analysis of Mexican anti-immigrant speech on Twitter during the Trump administration. Um, it now has to be said that information obtained from Twitter is not representative of the whole anti-immigrant speech in Mexico. Because those who publish on Twitter first obviously have an internet uh, connection for which Mexico has a marked urban rural fracture. And also they are relatively politicized as Twitter appears to be the preferred platform for interaction between the ruling class and the governed. Also, georeference tweets only represent a fraction of um, all tweets and those who publish geographical data are not necessarily representative of the wider Twitter population. So this is why in this section, we do not pretend to extend the analysis outside of Twitter. <clears throat> so the basic idea is to use real Donald Trump's anti-immigrant tweets. For those of you who don't know, uh, real Donald Trump was the Twitter account of uh, Donald Trump. <clears throat> So we propose to use those tweets to estimate by proxy the influence of U.S. anti-immigrant discourse on Mexican anti-immigrant speech. So uh, why Trump, you may ask? Because Donald Trump has had the ability to steer the terms of the migration debate on Twitter while also using the core elements of American racist discourse. And in that sense, his speech about migration is a pretty good approximation of uh, the whole American anti-immigrant speech. Um, diachronic analysis is a fancy and clever way to say that we uh, divided real Donald Trump tweets timeline into uh, moments of rupture that we call like, temporal milestones that highlight the evolution of his discourse about uh, migration. And how can we use those milestones? Well, firstly, by examining over the period the correlation between the real Donald Trump milestones and the variation in the number of Mexican anti-immigrant tweets. 
And secondly, by looking for lexical similarities between Mexican speech and real Donald Trump's using NLP technique like Engram model. Basically, it's uh, just comparing qualitatively and quantitatively the two uh, speeches, the American anti immigrant speech view observed through uh, Donald Trump's speech and the Mexican anti immigrant tweets, compare them at specific moments that are relevant in the uh, US political context. So with these two analyses, we should have a somewhat accurate picture of how American anti-immigrant rhetoric, it could be Donald Trump rhetoric or a similar one used by users uh, unknown to us for the moment, how uh, those rhetorics impacted both quantitatively and qualitatively the Mexican anti-immigrant speech on Twitter. So to conclude, uh, when completed, this research project could make several contributions, both to the NLP and uh, geopolitics community. First, regarding NLP, we'll have provided a concrete application of CNN in, in a social science problem, and we'll have designed a database and a model for detecting anti-immigrant speech in uh, Spanish. Regarding geopolitics, we'll have provided um, this work will provide evidence that uh, through digital social networks, highly politicized and sensitive debates in one territory, in that case, the US, uh, can be, uh, in that case, Mexico, sorry, can be reshaped by the repercussion of similar debates in entirely different territorial contexts, in our case, uh, the US. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that this uh, research would be greatly improved uh, if combined with all other analysis. Because for now, we don't know anything about the uh, circulation of uh, this kind of content inside the Mexican Twitter sphere or between the American and Mexican uh, Twitter sphere. So to help with that, we could do uh, a network uh, analysis. Another thing is that we will have studied the anti-immigrant speech on Twitter, but we don't know how uh, this speech on social media impacted uh, territorial power rivalry in Mexico, especially uh, anti-immigrant speech uh, at the northern and uh, southern Mexican uh, border. So that's it for my presentation. Um, if you have any questions or uh, remark, I really encourage you to, to ask them. If you have specific question about uh, the technical aspect of the model, uh, Dr. Alejandro Molinas Villegas will help me uh, respond them. And finally, I, will, I would like to thank the two reviewer who took time to read our article and obviously the organizing committee of the IGISC to, uh, for giving us the opportunity to present our work. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your wonderful presentation. I would like to open the floor to see if there are any questions uh, directed to Thomas regarding his paper, or if there are any questions on YouTube or Facebook. There's doesn't seem to be a question. I have one just general comment. Uh, what do you think would be the consequence of, for instance, uh, for your project and your research, if, uh, for instance, I mean, Donald Trump's uh, Twitter account was banned. So now you, there's no way for you to follow up on whatever he said before. Now imagine his account was banned in, in the first year of his presidency. Uh, what do you think you would need to do to adapt your methodology or your uh, research approach to have some other source of uh, social media uh, posts or something like that? We, we would have to uh, use American tweets published in English, uh, which would be a big challenge uh, just to obtain the data because 
I mean, we extracted the data using uh, AGIs, which allowed us to get historical data uh, since 2017. Uh, if you don't have such application, you can't you can't ask the the Twitter uh, API to give you historical tweets. So it would be very hard to recollect enough um, US anti-immigrant tweets. There would be also the problem that how do you identify uh, anti-immigrant tweets in English? Because our model is only for Spanish tweets, right? So it would yeah. be a different problem and it, it would have doubled the amount of work required, right? But we were pretty lucky that uh, his account was banned just after the end of his presidency. <laughs> so we, we, we still have three years of... Uh, of uh, <laughs> Of the data. Yeah. Of data. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Uh, are there any other questions uh, for Thomas? Yeah, there doesn't to seem to be a question. So great. Well, let me just not repeat the same mistake I did in the previous presentation. So I will ask again if there is someone with a question, please come forward. Uh, either write your question in the chat box so everyone can see it or come forward to the uh, stage or raise your hand or something. Make some noise. Okay, so now we are sure we don't have questions. So thank you very much, uh, Tama, again. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to recover the previous question that was wanted to be asked before. And... Uh, Said Ricardo Zacarias had a question. I don't know if you want to make your question uh, to uh, uh, Professor Silvan or you want me to read it out loud. Okay, I will read it. Um, the question was if there is some sort of order in the government or some, uh, not order, but uh, an institution, part of the government that is interested in implementing the sort of model of spatial analysis that you put forward uh, and if there has been any sort of interaction with them. Yeah, thank you, Rod Rodrigo. Um, and uh, to the person that is asking, yes, we, we actually are working together with the National, Com National Search Commission. And um, this uh, platform that I showed to you is actually being tuned for for them to conduct some um, search in the search of the separate people in the northern part. So um, hopefully this will be useful for for them. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Any follow up questions to any of our presenters? We still have a couple of minutes. If anyone wants to ask anything, the floor is open for you. Okay, well, there doesn't seem to be any more questions for this session. I appreciate all your time and effort for being here. We will make a short break and we'll return um, at 11 o'clock. Oh, sorry, Lillian has a question. Lillian. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, come up to the... Uh... Oh, just come up here uh, where I am so everyone can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. I have a question for the session, first uh, session that was talking about infrastructure and accessibility to green areas. Um, I agree with this uh, positive relationship about the, I mean, negative relationship be between infrastructure and less accessibility and less uh, uh, and more poverty with in the cities, right? But uh, what about if, if we think about the cities? I mean, the, the cities has a, a different story. For example, in downtown, probably the infrastructure is older. So maybe, uh, uh, yeah, it's older. So maybe there are some more parks or more green areas with less poverty instead of the surrounding uh, areas of a cities that are 
more um, with more density prob probably uh, because migration and population growth of, of the cities and probably in these areas I mean uh, there are more um, I mean there are less infrastructure because it is a new uh, infrastructure I mean and probably politics are different uh, from downtown uh, than in the surrounding cities so what I mean is that the the cities is has a lot uh, probably has a spatial variability about the their own story of infrastructure so uh, your data how can be related to this uh, spatial variability of population growth and infrastructure of in different time series of, of the story of, of a city I don't know if I, if I, I can be explained <laughs> If Adali, Mariana, or Marisol want to come up and answer the question, please do so. Okay. Uh, can I hear? Okay. Uh, yeah. Lily, um, yes. Yes, I think uh, our study was uh, limited in time, but I agree with you. Uh, uh, this this research um, needs to to uh, complete with the context of uh, uh -huh, of every uh, metropolitan zone we analyzed um, and also uh, added add uh, other variables like uh, you mentioned maybe um, we um, we try to uh, analyze uh, different uh, policies uh, around uh, around the infrastructure and the um, programs that try to um, regenerate or or uh, how to different policies that mm -hmm. that try to uh, make more accessible the green areas but uh, we cannot uh, add to our research because i think um, it's the like the next step of of our study okay yes. thank you perfect thank you to you Thank you very much. We have a question for Thomas. Is which kind of decisions can be made with the results of your research? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. It's a very uh, interesting one. Uh, and it's also a very difficult one to answer. Uh, like at this stage, uh, I think you understood that the results, it, they are just going to be clues that the Mexican anti-immigration debate was influenced uh, somehow by the U.S. anti-immigrant uh, debate. Uh, I think where you can take decision is more like when you have the network analysis part, when you know, when you can identify specifically uh, power strategies uh, on social media, people like. Donald Trump or the former mayor of Tijuana that instrumentalized a genuine anti-immigrant reaction for political or uh, electoral gains. Here, I mean, you have information about someone like bolstering hate speech for personal gains, right? So what can you do with that? Uh, I don't really know, like Twitter, we were talking about the Donald Trump's Twitter account getting banned. So that's how Twitter and other social media handles things. Uh, they just delete uh, accounts that uh, uh, circulate those type of content. I don't know if it's the ideal uh, decision because obviously uh, you have a liberty of speech uh, issues, but I mean, at least this research should give more information on the extent 
of anti-immigrant speech in, Mex in Mexico, because it's not like in the US. In the US, people speak relatively freely about uh, migration. In Mexico, it's still um, somewhat difficult to speak uh, about, uh, to express your anti-immigrant view in the public. Uh, and usually people do it, can do it on social media. Uh, so I don't know if I responded to your question, and I don't know if uh, Alejandro, if you you have another answer to this question. Well, I guess it was more related to what you thought could be made with, and I guess last seen any ongoing research, you sometimes don't really know yet what will be the final outcome, right? So yeah, and. I'll also because like the political framework to um, act on social media is still not defined and professor ulysses was talking about it earlier uh, you don't basically you don't you, you still don't have any rules laws that give this legal framework to act upon so but it can definitely motivate uh, politics to build this political framework. Yeah, for sure. Alejandro? Yeah, from the point of view of machine learning and uh, particularly uh, natural language processing, having this uh, manually validated data with the statistics about the agreement of what is hate speech, uh, talking about immigrant, anti-immigrant speech in Spanish, is, uh, is, is value, is, is a very valued resource because with this data, you can train or try to train other, other type of, of uh, recognizers, other type of models. And if you want to detect this, this kind of hate speech in the, in the in internet, so you start by directly to creating the model, not uh, trying to get the necessary data for to do this. Uh, I think that that's another outcome that is, uh, is a side, but is very valuable. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you both for your answers and thank, uh, all of the presenters in the session. Uh, we're coming, uh, we will have a short break right now and we will return at 11 o'clock with another keynote conference from uh, two great presenters. So stay tuned and be back here in eight minutes time, please. Thank you very much.
Well, hello everyone. Welcome back again to our uh, keynote conference. Hi. Uh, welcome back to our keynote conference. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professors Andrew Crooks and Alison Happenstall, uh, who will be giving this great talk on GIS uh, agent-based modeling, past, present, and future. Now, Alison Happenstall is professor of geocomputation at the University of Leeds and an SERC Turing Fellow. She has a PhD in artificial intelligence, the focus of which has, was developing machine learning algorithms and AI approaches as agent-based models. Uh, that were applied to solving complex spatial problems. Most of her current research is focused on developing and adapting machine learning approaches to understanding social phenomena, and she has particular interests in uh, data analytics, developing approaches for detecting heating, spatial temporal patterns in big data, quantifying uncertainty in simulations, and building more robust individual-based models through probabilistic programming and reinforcement learning. On the other hand, Andrew Crooks is professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Buffalo, uh, his research interests include geographic information science, geocomputation, agent-based agent -based modeling, social network analysis, urban geography, and computational social science. Uh, his research uh, focuses on exploring and understanding the natural and socioeconomic environments, specifically urban areas using GIS, spatial analysis, social network analysis, and agent-based modeling technology methodologies. Uh, currently, uh, Dr. Crooks is a co-editor of the journal Environment and Planning B, Urban Analytics and City Science and has recently published a book entitled Agent-Based Modeling and Geographic Information Science, a Practical Primer. And as a personal note, I am very, very, very happy to introduce them because I first came to know the names when I first read the Agent-Based Modeling uh, Big Red Book, uh, which I was very, very happy to read. And now it's just a great pleasure to have you guys here and hear you uh, talk about this uh, just great topic. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. That the, My copy of that big red book actually holds my monitor up to the right height. So it's useful every, every day. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk to you, uh, particularly to Kareem for all sort of dealing with loads of my questions and putting this together. It's a real pleasure to be here. So um, we've been introduced. Uh, one slight amendment. I've just moved to the University of Glasgow, which is a little bit further north in the UK. Um, but everything else, absolutely right. So on behalf of Andrew and I, it's, it's really nice to be here and chat to you. Um, so Andrew's controlling the slides. This is how we're doing it. It's going to be so slick, like Mulder and Scully, not Laurel and Hardy. Um, so between us, um, Andrew and I have kind of grown up in academia together. Um, weirdly enough, despite having written like the big red book and the more recent book, I think this is possibly only the second time we've presented together um, and we're a little bit competitive and this slide actually shows you how competitive we are who can have the most acknowledgement so um, we're both very lucky that but in our respective uh, countries we've been funded by lots of different bodies to acknowledge it plus we both work with excellent teams of people as well and a lot of what we're going to talk about today is um, the work of our research group um, so it's really important we want to put that in first to acknowledge it so what are we going to talk about? Well, really, we're going to have a little bit of a talk about, you know, why do we use agent based models? Uh, both Andrew and I are coming from the perspective of modeling in cities. That's kind of been our upbringing in academia. So there's a little bit of an urban analytics slant to this. Um, we're going to talk about GIS and ABM as well, particularly the linkages and the benefits of doing that. Um, the big red book. So, so 2012 has been replaced by the white book with the hideous cover that I don't like, um, which is a book all about ABM GIS type stuff. And one of the reasons Andrew and I wanted to do this talk together is that, you know, we've written this book and it's something we're both really interested in. Plus, I think it's a lot more interesting having a keynote with two people talking rather than just one person for 45 minutes. So we're going to talk about sort of GIS. ABM, and then we're going to focus a little bit more going back onto agent-based models, which is kind of you know the main grist of the work both of us are doing. And um, we're going to talk about some of the challenges and some of the ways we might get around those challenges, particularly behavior and uncertainty quantification. And then we'll round off with you know some sort of lofty thoughts about where do we go from here. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully this movie will be working. This is Trafalgar Square. Uh, in London a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. And what you see here, it's um, about 11, 12 o'clock in the daytime, lots of people milling around. Now, 
who are these people? What are they doing? Where are they going? And in terms of simulating urban systems and cities, these are kind of the key questions that we're really interested in finding out the answers to. Now, there's two parts to working the, that answer out. One part comes from data. There's so much data around now, it's, it provides more challenges than opportunities in my opinion. But in this context, we've got environmental data, your air pollution sensors, footfall sensors, traffic cameras, people help take their mobile devices with them. So we've, we've got individual level type data. And then we've got a whole bunch of, I would say new methods, but you know, a lot of machine learning methods have been around for decades. Um, we've got these new sort of methods that can help us interrogate and understand what's going on inside the data. So, you know, the, the sort of idea behind the sort of work Andrew and I are interested in is, can we put these two things together to really understand what's going on inside cities? What's going to happen over time as well? The consequences, can we model it? And this kind of it really is sort of a, the field of urban analytics. Now, um, urban analytics is one of those terms um, such as digital twins, which I'll come on to in a moment, which is quite loaded. So what do we mean by urban analytics? Well, for uh, scholars such as Andrew and I, it really is about applying methods to data and modeling things that are going on in cities. That's what we're really interested in. Um, so here it is. It's a nice quote from Mike Batty. We want to explore, understand and predict. Don't move on yet, Andrew. Um, one of the big things that's going on in the UK, and I won't be surprised if the US follow and Mexico, is this notion of digital twins. So the idea, can we capture a system and put it in a computer and manipulate it? It's a very, very attractive idea to governments and agencies. And there's a huge amount going on in the UK with the Turing Institute and UK universities trying to recreate a city on a computer. Now, we can perhaps talk about at the end whether I think that's a sensible idea or not, but that's a huge thrust of the work that's happening in agent-based modeling and cities is going in that direction. And I've a strong feeling it will continue to go in that direction for several years to come. Next slide, please, Andrew. So good at pressing the button. So why are um, we put urban environments here so difficult to predict but I mean this could be why are any systems geographical systems difficult to predict well <clears throat> my background my first degree was in physics and I can tell you I had lots of laws in physics that that were very helpful geographers we don't have any social scientists maybe one maybe one Tobler's law for those of you who don't know it it basically states things that are close together are more similar than things that are far apart now, you know, you could question, does this law still hold in geography? But that, you know, with interconnectedness and the, yeah, social media, et cetera, et cetera. But that's our one type of law. A geographical system, they change over space and time. You think about your own city in the daytime and you think about it at nighttime. There's probably very different activities that are going on. These change over space and time. And that makes it really complex if you're trying to understand how systems evolve. And then you have feedbacks happening as well. And what happens, so what happens if you close down part of your city temporarily, et cetera, et cetera. Human behavior, I'll come on to in a moment, but again, very difficult to try and uh, simulate human behavior. And you would never, ever, 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 unless you're a madman, want to simulate the whole range of human behaviors. Often we're just interested in certain well-known types of behaviors. I'll come back to. In this area, there has been a sort of a real shift from the 60s, 70s, where a lot of the modeling was focused at the top level, the aggregate level. So we would look at modeling populations and seem, apply a rule or, or some intervention to a population and see what would happen. Now, that's partly, I think, because there's a lack of individual level data, also a lack of computational models. So you've seen in the last sort of 20 years a real change from these top-down models, applying rules to everyone downwards, to the bottom-up models. And these are the sort of individual-based models and really come into vogue. And, and there's two quotes here, um, David O'Silver, Mike Batty, and both of them are saying the same thing, that social systems, cities, whatever you're interested in, are really powered by de decisions and actions of individuals. And what we are interested in as modelers is trying to capture that and simulate it. And so we can understand what happens to cities, or people over space and over time. <coughs> OK, so so I think there's a slight lag in, in change. <laughs> So uh, why? Yeah. why? Why are we bothering? Um, well, um, I'm at the University of Glasgow and um, you know it's been really tricky getting into work because there's some conference going on. You're probably aware 
that we've got COP26 going on in Glasgow at the moment. Um, and it's our part in this, it, it, you know, is really important. There are predictions that uh, you know, more people will be living in urban areas than rural areas by 2050. The pressure on cities is immense, rapid urbanisation. So the work we do in trying to recreate these cities in simulations and what people are doing can really feed into that agenda on how we make cities more sustainable, make them energy efficient and make them equitable so they work for everybody as well. So there's lots going on in COP26. Uh, I do feel that the area that we work in has a really important part to play in helping this effort as well. So uh, the question we often ask people when we are giving these types of talks is, you know, what is agent-based modeling? Have you seen agent-based models before? And often the answer is we've never seen people have never seen the agent-based models before. But we would like to say that you know the agent-based models are seen all over the place. Like for example, if you watch any of the movies on this slide, have been generated through massive uh, simulation software, like um, large fight scenes for from Avengers or um, the swarming of apes in Planet of the Apes and things like that. You know. Asian-based models are widely used in TV and movies to recreate large fight scenes of autonomous actors instead of having to have really a lot of people, right? And the idea is through these interactions, more aggregate patterns emerge, as Alison sort of alluded to. These systems have evolved and changed changed over over time. Um, and the idea of Asian-based modeling is this has been around for a while now. And, um, you know, Alison insists that I we use this slide with respect to um, SimCity, and, um, which is where we have like a group of autonomous individuals. Each, each one represents an individual group. A group, for example, could be several individuals in a family created um, a household unit. And we situate these people in, um, in a virtual environment. And then we see what what might happen in 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 these, for example, right? Or another way, abs more abstract way of thinking about agent-based modeling is that these are sort of rule-based systems. And I know Alison will come back to the rules later on with respect to machine learning. And the idea is we create artificial worlds. These are our silico in silico worlds, um, computer simulations. Within these simulations, we um, throw in as a certain number of pe people or agents, these have genius actors, we give them rules, uh, you know, and the rules can be very simple. For example, if a certain condition is met, then do this or do that. So for example, if the fire alarm goes off, exit the building, else stay, um, stay in the building. Or if, um, if, um, there's a car in front of you, slow it down so you don't want to crash your car into, into these types of things. And we can em em employ rules, so these rules to individuals. These individuals are connected to each other through their social networks or just through their adjacency with each other, going back to Tobler's law of geography. And we can see what happens in these models. Just to give a very simple example, here we are looking at a, a very simple traffic model for, um, that comes with net logo an age-based modeling toolkit where you have each car each car here is an agent it's a sort of a very american analogy in the sense that there's only one person per car um and yeah so every every in, in each individual um car here is one one agent they have very simple rules if there's a car ahead of you you slow down you don't want to crash your car if there's no car ahead of you you speed up and these simple rules apply to lots of different agents, explain basically, show how sort of traffic jams form. So the cars are all moving forward, but because of that inability to move constantly, keep a constant speed, then there's a traffic jam that forms backwards with respect to this. And you, we can capture sort of individual movement. The red line is this individual red car. And then the green here is sort of the average traffic speed. And the idea is simple rules applied to many different agents can lead to more complicated phenomena occurring. And being sort of a GIS conference here and a GIS sort of um, feel, you know, we're interested in, and this sort of goes back to the, the, the big red book, I guess, if you want to call it. And also more recently, you know, why were we interested in this? And the idea is we or why link it to GIS or geographical information systems or, and the science behind those things. And the idea is by linking it to spatial data, we can actually link agents to actually real world locations. Um, and I'll give examples of this as we go through. And also the built environment or the natural environment can act as the foundation or layers 
it says the GIS layers work with um we use layers in GIS to represent different themes and be used as our artificial world. More importantly, you know, um, the other rationale for, for linking GIS and ABM is that it allows for the emergence this, um, of phenomena through individual interactions over space and time, something the GIS by itself is not very good at handling is this space to time dimensions type, type of thing. And just give an, an an analogy here, you know, with with all modeling, and even did, you know, we abstract from the real world. We might have a series of layers representing the physical environment, or so, some social environment information, or say some social media and things like that. And we can use these as layers to represent our, artific our, our, our artificial world, and then see what happens inside of them. So going back to that simple car analogy earlier. You might be interested, for example, using census data to work out where do people live and then where do people work. So in this sort of figure here, we have an area called in, in what, near Washington, D.C. called Tyson's Corner. This is this red area here. And then from the census data, we know these are the census tracts or census areas where people, for, people who work in Tyson's Corner come from. So if we wanted to create a simple traffic model here um, with respect to you know, people leaving their house, driving to work and then causing congestion to occur, we can do that through these types of data sets, sort of linking GIS and age and base models together. So this, to, just to demonstrate that's a very simple proof of concept. Here, we have red dots, these are our individual cars. These individual cars are driving to, their, to this Tyson's corner area. And when they are forming these blobs, this is where sort of traffic jams are occurring. So the idea is we can take data and use that to parameterize our models. And we'll come back to parameterization and validation of models in, in a little bit as well. You also might be interested, for example, Alison mentioned COP26 and climate change. One of the big problems, as Alison mentioned, is more and more people are going to be living in cities, right? Um, you know, and because more and more people are living in cities, where are people going to live? In, in a lot of places, living in cities, you know, the only places one can build are in, in the floodplains. So some work that with um, a, a postdoctoral fellow at, um, um, at um, Columbia University at the moment, uh, Mona Hamati and, and some colleagues, we were looking at urban growth around Colorado Springs and using an agent-based model of people basically buying and selling land and making decisions. Do I buy? Do I buy a piece of land here or do I buy a piece of land there, depending on how much they know about um, flood risk and environmental change? You can sort of predict potentially, you know, or what might happen in the future if you have this scenario over this scenario. So the idea is if you take more of an environmental stance, you know, and promote building away from floodplains, and things like that, you can basically reduce the potentially number of people or the amount of damage a flood could actually do in an, er an area. So the idea here is we're taking, you know, using environmental data and geographical information to help prioritize and build better agent-based models. And we people have been building models for a long, long time. And um, but agent-based models have been used for a whole but whole host of geographical applications. Anything from the micro movement of pedestrians over seconds. So these are very small scale scale models, just like very similar to the Gather Town, really, uh, as you're moving through the auditorium here. And um, to more large scale um, processes that oper operate over more macro um, areas so uh, and over many more years, such as uh, migration or residential location, and urban growth. But models, as I say, can be have been developed over a whole spectrum of thing, of activities where individual decision making matters. And this is one of the great utilities of agent based modeling is that we can focus on individual decision making and how through individuals decision making more aggregate patterns emerge, be that of the the, the um, individuals driving the cars, leading traffic congestion, to that of the individual people walking and the um, formation of crowds, to um, to that of basically housing markets, people buying and selling land leads to property markets emerging from the individual actions. More recently, um, yeah, a more recent example that if we did that uh, diagram that Andrew just showed you, 
and we actually we plotted things on from the last 12 months we can imagine that most of the applications there are going to be covid based um now the reason we put this in is just to allow me to have a, a few minutes of, of ranting it was it was non-negotiable for andrew but at the beginning of the pandemic last year um uh, there was this great article that came out um, in the Washington Post and it had some NetLogo videos embedded showing a simple contagion model and really, really nicely sort of showed what you can do and how easily you, you can simulate this using a tool like NetLogo. Now, what we've now seen, uh, if you go type into Google agent-based model, it literally is COVID, COVID, COVID models. This is fantastic in one way, but my slight rant about this is that a lot of these models are not parameterized well. They have so many assumptions in, there's no real data, they're not validated. I feel slightly uneasy that um, these models are now being looked at uh, by governments. In the UK, our eventual lockdown was informed by a sort of micro simulation model out of Imperial University in London. But these models are, you know, um, promising to be able to do these things. And because you can create such easy visualizations as well th through them, um, it's almost selling a false hope. These models aren't, no one quantifies the uncertainty or robustly calibrates them. So that's my slight rant that Andrew's allowed me to have in it about these models. And I will kind of come back to addressing a couple of these points as, as we go on. <coughs> Next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So. Can the, the slide that Andrew showed a few ago, so it really does allude to the fact that agent-based modeling has had a massive growth in the last sort of 20 years. And this is our attempt, and we probably have missed out a few key texts to sort of look at um, where the key textbooks have come. You know, this sort of Epstein and Axtell book back in 96 through to the, the Big Red Book in 2012, um, and then through to 2019 with our amazing agent-based modeling book as well. But they, you know, if you look, the concentration of books and papers that are coming out are increasing more. Go to the next slide. Um, I've kind of coined uh, a sort of uh, rule uh, at a conference a few months ago, Heppenstall's Law. So uh, the point with which you start seeing papers that are about key challenges, future developments, uh, strategic directions of something, it's made it. So I think, you know, if we look and yeah, you know, Andrew and I are both guilty of, of doing this as well, writing these papers. Um, agent-based modeling has reached a point of acceptance within re the research community that, you know, the literature pre-pandemic has been saturated with these types of papers. Now, what I picked out in the top left um, is a paper that Andrew co-authored back in 2008. And what's really nice about it is that agent-based modeling was just starting to uh, come to a lot of people's attention. And that paper lays out all the challenges that the authors sort of looked at um, as a list of that agent-based modeling needs to address. So there was theory, there was initialization, aggregation, uh, validation, and so on. And when we went, came to draw this paper on here, which is Talks-based, um, which is on here as well, last year, we sort of went back to the 2008 paper and then started looking around in the literature and looking around at, you know, at the field and, Essentially, how many do we think uh, we've uh, hit? No, none of the challenges that Crux et al. set out in 2008 have really been addressed. There's certainly been progress in some areas, but I fear it's things like COVID that slightly distracted us, or is it the fact that you can put together an agent-based model so quickly without really understanding the, the modeling process and what needs to go in there, that the literature is full of all these types of little toy models, but those core methodological issues that we need to take it from acceptance at research level to acceptance into the wider community, policymakers, governments, isn't quite there yet. And next slide, please. Okay, so what I'm going to do for a few slides is I'm going to talk about some of these challenges. Um, some, you know, I'll talk about with some potential solutions. Others, I don't have a clue about the solutions. And this is one of them. So this is such an interesting problem. And I, I would be really interested to hear from anybody who is working within this area or has uh, uh, some new methods that I may not have heard about. So representativeness and scale. The idea that, as the diagram shows you, at the micro level, you've got a group of people and you actually want to simulate a town or you want to simulate a city. So somehow you have to work out what are the most important processes, behaviors at that individual level, and how do you scale it up, aggregate them up to a group level, up to a city level? How do you go from one person to a couple of people, 10 to a crowd? What are the important processes there? 
the other thing that's really hand in hand with that for often for us is the scale issue as well. So you want to model a neighborhood. What are the really important things at a neighborhood? Are those going to be the same things that are important at county level, um, at regional level? No. And that kind of ties into the whole theory of ecological fallacy, modifiable aerial unit problem. I was a geographer for a while. Uh, and, and these are really difficult problems to get around. And, and, you know, of course, you've got to consider that with agent based models. We've also got feedbacks that will occur across different scales and different aggregations as well. <clears throat> There's a couple of papers here that are interesting. There's the Evans and Kelly one. Uh, they basically take, aggregated their data to different scales and calibrated it. And, you know, obvious, I suppose that different values come out at whichever scale you look at your model at. So again, how do, how do you make clear that those processes that are really important here are represented here, if they're important at that level, which is another question. The uh, Valbuna et al. one is a nice one. They had a whole bunch of farmers, data and individual farmers, and wanted to scale up to European level. So they created a typology of behaviors, characteristics of the different farmers to try and preserve some of those dynamics and processes to be able to scale up as well. It's a really, really interesting area, but such a difficult area to get ahead from. And partly is because we've got these notion of these link spaces as well. So it's not just uh, pulling things up, it's people are connected. Your social network and your spatial network are often really difficult to put the two together. My closest friends may not live near to me, uh, you know, especially in the pandemic as well. The shift in relationships between people, the distance is that. Uh, you know, distances haven't really mattered so much because of uh, tools like GatherTown and Zoom. To move over. Um, and yeah, so building on this and linking back to the urban analytics, you know, now in that we're having more and more basically data now to be able to co collect and understand what's happening ar around us, right? When Alice and I both first started in our interests in GIS and things like that, maybe all the data that we had was going to be census data or things from remote sense satellite data and, th and things like that. Now we have like uh, observational data uh, for, from all walks of life really. Um, and this is giving us sort of a new lens to look at cities as well. Yeah. And also a new lens to study these linked spaces, uh, these connections between us. So, you know, we can look at, say, for example, who talks to who on Facebook or who leaves comments to each other on Facebook or who tweets or retweets other pe comments on people's Twitter accounts and things like that. Or, you know, more and more, we can also look at um, different social networking sites in different countries. So Weibo from China, for example, or VK for, um, from, for, from, from Russia. And there's also just, you know, the nature of geographical data is changing. In the old days, we would have say, some type of geographical footprint, like a census block or a zip code or a postcode and things like that. Now we can derive this, um, geographical data from toponyms, place names, address of gazetteers and things like that. And this is all giving us sort of a new lens and a new way to study cities and also uh, all geographical areas in, in general. And yeah, so we can monitor cities and, and with the advances in geographical data science, I know Danny's talking after us, and um, you know, we have new ways to analyze these um, data sets as well, and like with machine learning and things like that. And, and, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. And the idea is, can we start modeling these types of linked spaces? So the idea is, you know, can we model our physical spaces where we operate? So here we have a little a toy agent based model, right? So you can sort of see the people going from their home locations to their work locations in this hypothetical city. Um, and it, they are connected both in their physical networks, so their kinship networks. These are gonna be the red lines and also their, um, work networks so your your social networks and the idea is as people move through space and move through space we have different types of networks forming evolving and changing you know this type of network and link spaces has a lot of connotations with respect to say misinformation covid for example um anti-vaccine sentiment how that propagates through cyberspace uh, your social networks and how that you know anti-vaccine sentiment might lead to more um disease outbreaks in the real world in the physical world so to speak and the idea is can we capture those types of link spaces through new sources of data and this is again one of those 
in really interesting areas that could be totally explored through agent-based modeling and also advances in machine learning. So the idea maybe would be to study both the physical world around us, who's connected to whom using cell, cell phone data, for example, or social networks in your cyberspace, how we can link these to other types of data sets that are currently emerging, like open street maps, the, you know, the digital map of the world, uh, population data, say from LandScan or, or, or trends in Google, and how through um, machine learning techniques we can extract social network information, physical network information, combine these together and help inform, build agent-based models. At the moment, agent-based modeling is only really touching upon, only, at, least, at least in the social sciences and geographical sciences only recently you know we we're t touching upon i think the ut what we can do with machine learning and ai um with respect to parameterizing agent-based models using machine learning with inside of agent-based models to, to make better decisions or to look at the outcomes of models and those are things that i know alison is going to come back to right now really actually Thanks, Andrew. So, you know, that's kind of nicely set up for me to uh, bring this video back. And, you know, the whole idea of this work that we're doing and, you know, what we've been talking about is this idea of creating these digital twins or trying to understand a model cities better. Uh, you go on, Andrew. And the way that we can do that really is uh, through a technique that allows us to simulate the individuals. And that's why we're going to start talking a little bit now more about agent-based modeling and, and the challenges that are associated with them. And the first one I want to talk about is uh, behavior. Now, there's um, I, I do this with all my students and classes that there's a, something I, I stole from Bill Kennedy at GMU. So if you think of a number between one and four, I would I would bet I would bet good English money, which is worthless, um, that at least 70% of you uh, will say the number three. And then maybe 20% will say number two, and then the rest of you will say one or four. Now, what, what does that tell me? That tells me that behavior um, is not entirely unpredictable. There are some things that we do know. There's, uh, you know, we know that we can get up, we go to, well, pre-pandemic, we would get up, we'd go to work, perhaps drop the kids at school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, what's tricky for us in behavior is it's uh, simulating. Sorry, I've got somebody uh, at my door. <laughs> Um, we just close the curtain. Don't you love doing this in Zoom? What's tricky for us is um, getting the right sort of data. Does it contain the right sort of processes in there? When you're trying to simulate things, uh, behavioral processes and how people think and what makes some decision, those are softer psychological qualities. How can we how can we get that and quantify that to put into our models? And if we can get a handle on the right sort of data, the right resolution, the next question is, which framework shall we use as well? And, you know, there are so many behavioral frameworks now. The two papers here, um, the shorter ones, are excellent for reviewing all the different types of uh, behavioral models we can use. So there's rational man. You know, we all are very rational. We make very rational decisions. Uh, we have universal knowledge, you know, ranging through to these more cognitive type of models as well. Um, <clears throat> there's a, been a bit of a move in agent-based modeling as well to sort of looking at uh, being more transparent and open. And that's where the ODD comes in as well. So the other paper is a protocol around that as well. And that transparency, it's like Andrew, go on, is uh, really, really important. Honestly, you have one job, one job, Professor. So taking that uh, graph that Andrew showed you earlier, this time, if we, Andrew, you're gonna need to hit it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to fire him. If we switch those axes around, and this time we're going to look at how complex is the system, uh, the environment have to be against how complex does the behavior of the agents need to be, Andrew? And a little bit of magic here. So taking those um, applications that we showed you earlier, hopefully this is working so you can see it, because I think there's, there's a slight lag between Andrew and I here. Um, there's only a couple of these applications where the, both the environment and, and the behavior is quite complex. And that's involving things around riots and crime. And these were the applications that were down in the bottom left. So at a fine scale, um, at, at a small temporal resolution updating quite, quite um, frequently. Next slide. Now, if we tabulate all those ones out, and, and it is a bit of a boring table, don't bother too much about looking about at it. We kind of did this because we were interested in looking at, you know, what were the behavioral frameworks that we used? And pretty much all but one were mathematical models as well. And we were also, we were also interested when we were doing this and looking at um, sort of spatial temporal scales as well and tabulating it. But what's interesting as well, that it's quite mixed on um, 
which of the models were validated and weren't validated, which, but don't worry, I'm going to come on to validation, uh, a little, another pet hate of mine. Next slide, please, Andrew. <clears throat> so I want to just give a couple of examples about behavior um, and, and then a, a suggestion about what where the area agent-based modeling is going in behavior in terms of trying to simulate how people move around cities, urban spaces, et cetera. This is work I did with um, an ex-colleague of mine, Nick Mallison at Leeds, and his PhD was all about creating an agent-based models of burglars. They go to a house, steal something, go sell it for, for drugs. Now, this was done in conjunction with the local police organization. And at the time, this is a representation of Leeds in the UK. Um, this area of Leeds was one of the most burgled in the country. It was full of student houses, lots of goods to steal. And we had information um, from burglars who were in prison about their motivation for burgling as well as the police. Now, obviously, those burglars are not very good ones. They're the failed ones because they've been caught. But we got a lot of behavioral information there about what motivated them. And we had long discussions about how should we get all this information about the different behaviors and put this into the agents. And we came up with using the PEX model. So it's physical, emotional, cognitive and social, I think, I probably got that wrong. Um, and these are different ways that you can handle the behavior and the rules. So if they're tired, they go to sleep. Uh, and in this case, if they wanted drugs, they would burgle a house to get money. So kind of very simple, uh, not, well, not, not so simple, but simple rules we put in. What was really nice about this is that, um, you know, it, it the model was good and we managed to validate it against uh, a development that was happening at the time, which was part of Leeds was being regenerated. And we used the model and, and all the crime data to sort of work out where was being burgled and that, which correlated quite nicely to the data, to the real data. But also when they regenerated this area, where was the crime likely to displace to as well? <clears throat> and so on all in all, it was quite a nice one. It was a validated model, more complicated behavior and useful to the local police as well. Next slide, please. Um, this next one, um, again, I stole this from my colleague, Nick Mallison, who's not here, so it's OK. Just don't tell him what I'm about to say. Um, this is an example of where we didn't quite get it right so much. Um, here, th this was a whole model uh, thinking about can we use all these different types of data that Andrew's just been talking about, create an agent-based model, set them off walking around somewhere and uh, validate it against sensor data. The motivation being that these are some little towns um, in Yorkshire, the part of the country in England I live in, and a lot of the councils, the local towns, were putting up football cameras so they could capture how many people were there, so they could work out, you know, how to manage events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as a real, and we got this data for free, so we we, we had a real novel um, opportunity here to build a model and and actually validate it against real real data. So what did we do? We took the UK census, we created a population put them into houses, uh, created them into agents. We used micro simulation, then turned them into agents. And um, in the UK, we have this uh, time work survey. So people fill in a survey and, and it basically tells what they do with their time. So we built that in as well and sent them off. And uh, I think Nick and his, uh, his then researcher, Thomas, just sat back and waited for the gold to come in. Next slide. What they actually found uh, on this slide when it loads up, that the black, thick black line is the real data. And they found if you look at the bottom, the hours at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a big dip. There's a big difference between the real and expected. And um, I remember them going, hmm, but this can't be right. We've put everything in. The data's told us. Um, it just so happened that there was a local science cafe in one of the towns. So I went to present this work to them. And I got a very strong feedback that we'd missed out a whole section of the population. And in this case, it was retired people. So in this particular area, people would um, go to work, people would take their kids to school. And at 10 o'clock, apparently, all the older retired people would come out because the town was quiet. And that then went, went we went to find some data about that type of time use, put that in, and as you can see, it, the model did better. Now, the big lesson here is that we can't just rely on our quantitative data. You know, big data, woo, we'll solve the world. No, we need to look at mixed data methods. We really need to think about validating. I mean, I'm a computer scientist, so I don't like actually talking to people, but we need to work with people who do like talking to people on qualitative data. So the work was eventually successful, but it's nice because there's a bit of a lesson in there about sort of data we use and the assumptions we make. Next slide, please, Andrew. 
<clears throat> can we get, yes, I guess this begs the question, can we get behavior right? Well, as I said, you would never ever want to model the entirety of human behavior. Um, you'd only want to know well-defined behaviors. There are some examples uh, where people want to be able to pick out unexpected behavior, but generally for the rest of us in, in looking around the cities, we're looking for a sort of routine behavior or trying to understand what behaviors are bringing people into cities. We need that rich data. We need lots of data because, you know, somebody gets information in the city, changes what they do. There's a feedback. We need to be able to capture that, the space time. Um, assumptions I've already covered. And, you know, one of the big challenges is how do you extract behavioral rules from qualitative data as well as quantitative data? And that I think there has been quite a lot of progress in that way. But one of the big drawbacks is often we've got, oh, understandably, historical data. So we're looking at things that have happened in the past to predict the future. Now, that's fine as if in those examples where we're looking at known type of behaviours. But if we do actually want to go, well, we're going to pedestrianise the entirety of London. What's going to happen? Or I don't know, if there's a global pandemic, we're going to lock everybody down for six months. What will happen? How do we transition out safely? These are experiences that historical data doesn't have. And that's where I think we need to start thinking about other ways to get the behaviour right. Next slide, please. So this is some work um, one of my PhD students is playing around with at the moment. And again, anyone working in this area would love to love to hear from you. Um, reinforcement learning, it's a branch of machine learning where you essentially you train your agent. And if it does what you want it to do correctly, you reward it. Reinforcement learning, kind of a Pavlov's dog on a computer. We've uh, played around with a simple predator prey model. The white pill is the, can I read that with predator? The little green thing is the prey. We set up an environment with the four barriers in, and then we've sort of played around with it. And we've seen if the agents learn. So the prey have been learning to track, as video says, the prey have been learning to evade. So we've been playing around with a lot, of, and there is training involved in all of this as well. We have a paper coming out on this that's uh, looking at whether we can actually recreate these sort of more complex behaviors. This is quite a simple one. Uh, the video on the left is uh, from Mapbox. It's not um, work we've done, but this is kind of where we want to go. We want to be able to sort of train these agents in these simple environments, perhaps make them much more complex, uh, reflecting what humans would do, then drop them into a platform such as Unity where we can accurately recreate the environment and let them go. So thus, we'll be right up here on that graph. We're going to have very complex agents in a very complex environment. What can go wrong? Nothing. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, so calibration and validation is if you're ever in a pub with me and talk to me about agent-based models, just avoid this as, as well as COVID, uh, be fine. <coughs> what is calibration and validation? Well, to me, this is the biggest area that as agent-based models, spatial agent-based models, we have neglected um, a why probably because it is so difficult. Agent-based models are built for lots of different types of examples um, and are quite unique. So naturally, when you have results and outputs, they're usually unique to a particular example. And that's possibly why we have no universal platform codes or that there are efforts in that area. What are we trying to evaluate? That will be dependent entirely on what your research is aimed at. Um, what scale, what time? These are, you know, big questions, uh, but there's no sort of real robust approach to be able to do this within agent-based modeling. Now, I think this is one of the biggest barriers we have because if we don't validate properly, we don't quantify the uncertainty in the model. So, for example, when we create a model of uh, COVID transmission and we go to the government saying, you know, you have to do this now, they will want to know, well, how sure are you? <clears throat> where's the uncertainty? I'm X percentage sure in this situation this will happen. So I think this is one of our big barriers, but then we have other disciplines, um, you know, meteorology, they create weather forecasts. I and mean, certainly in the UK, we have weather forecasts and we have certainty attached to it. There's a percentage chance it's going to rain or be sunny or be dark at five o'clock in the UK at the moment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we know... Sorry. No, no. Uh, I just want to say, you know, we'll, we have about five minutes left in this t in this talk. This for so, so the people um, in the audience here, um, you know. But you know, as Alison mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, we, validation is one of the hardest things to go about with respect to agent based models. And we have new sources of data, in, and new ways of extracting data um, information from from data. For example, we've been using um, CCTV imagery data to help validate pedestrian models. So here we have individual 
pedestrian paths, we can extract these paths from um, from this data and then train a model model on this data to see and then predict what might happen in the future. Um, Sarah Wise at um, University College London now, she's been using social media to help validate her um, models of evacuation from like wildfire events say, and, 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 and things like that. There's a lot of potential novel ways of validating um, um, our models now with new, new sources of data. And this now goes back to um, Alison's work. Well, I'm just going to ask Kareem, um, how long do we have left? Because I really don't want us to overrun. <laughs> Uh, okay, five minutes, we can do that. Um, <laughs> okay, right, you're going to get a condensed version. So uh, there's lots of uncertainty in agent-based models, which are listed there. Next slide. Uh, we've been sort of looking at a bunch of techniques um, from meteorology um, to try and get a handle on how can we quantify uncertainty. And we've been playing around with history matching and uh, Bayesian computation. Next slide. And the idea behind these really is to sort of uh, shrink down your uh, solution space so you can try and find uh, more plausible solutions really quickly to your models. Uh, you're throwing out all the uncertain areas. And this is kind of, um, we'll skip over that one. We have a paper coming out on this one so uh, and that one. For the sake of time, uh, if anyone's interested, you can ask me questions or we can uh, send you the paper. <coughs> We've played around this using Sugarscape. And in, in this case, we've looked at two parameters, metabolism and vision. What are the parameters those have to be to sustain a population of 66? Next slide. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and what we did here, the history matching, uh, we sort of know what the, <laughs> can you go back one? Uh, we know what the, uh, the size of the spaces and parameters are, and you sort of feed that into the history matching algorithm. And the orange spaces are where there are plausible solutions. So your parameters that you need for that population 66 might come out from that. And you run several waves in that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then the history matching feeds that last one into the ABC. And all the ABC, all the ABC does is create a probability of what combination of parameters that are most likely to give you that 66, that magic population of 66. And here you can see there's lots of different ranges here, the, the lightest color being the most suitable sets so parameters. And what's interesting about this, instead of giving you one value, it gives you a range of different types of parameters and an idea about the solution space as well. Uh, next, please. I'm going to skip over this um, um, next next one again. Um, I was then going to, Andrew, if you just want to go to the summary slide, I was then going to talk a bit about dynamic data simulation. Um, <clears throat> and that's just the idea of where we're going with all this, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, creating these digital twins. But and if we can put like real live time data in as things happen, so if an event happens in the middle of Glasgow and the city has to be shut down, we can get very short-term accurate forecasts. The problem being that as your, your model and your forecast, uh, <clears throat> sorry, your model and real data start like this, but as your simulation goes, they come apart. So let's put the data back in. And we're doing a lot of work um, at Leeds and Glasgow and Turing um, on methods to do this. Andrew? We'll skip over big data. We're out, sorry, data. Oh, no, uh, if you want to go to the uh, summary, Andrew, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, sorry about that. Um, so, so, you know, in general, it, we sort of talked at the beginning that ABM sort of grown over time. And as Alison sort of alluded to, understanding human behavior is really, really hard. Right? And it's probably the, the hardest, one of the hardest challenges um, that we're trying to grapple with here. And that's, you know, it's manifests itself really well with cities. Ex cities are extremely complicated or extremely complex, right? And, more, and currently there is this drive towards more digital twins, digital representations of the world around us, from simple representations to more complicated representations. And I think this is something that, you know, 
sort of a really great opportunity that we are now in because we have data, data that we never had before, and also um, computational power, which we'll come back to with, um, with opportunities. And now we have more and more as a growth of urban analytics with respect to what we've been talking about today uh, allows us, you know, um, to explore urban systems at very fine spatial and temporal scales. And um, this is another issue. Most of the problems that we've talked about today, if you um, are very small scale, very fine scale resolution problems, not long term urban long term problems. So there's a, potentially a mismatch between digital twins and um, um, longer term processes. But that's a conversation that Alice and I just started to have a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then, you know, we can capture this through agent based modeling, through new techniques coming out of machine learning and AI, if you want to call it that, and also just geographical or geospatial analysis is playing a greater role in this. One thing I think that's super exciting at the moment is the challenge of developing high fidelity models of human behavior. Alison hinted at this, already alluded to that as well. You know, it's, it's a real challenge building high fidelity models of behavior and potentially over, very scary to think of like trying to capture a lot of types of human behavior, but you know, everyone's different. How much heterogeneity do we need in a population? Because we know what happens at one level impacts what happens in another level and everything's interconnected. Think about Wuhan, China, and how, you know, a couple of, uh, less than two years ago, some people got infected with a new disease. Now that caught in three interactions, the whole, we have a global pandemic on our hands, right? And also the data is becoming more and more prolific. And, the, the, you know, some people are fascinated by streaming data sets. Other people are fascinated by more authoritative census data sets. But I think if we, are, we, you know, if you really want to tackle societal problems, you probably have to use a whole universe of data, not just one data type, but multiple data types, both qualitative data and quantitative data, and merge them together to really understand what's happening around us. And because we had the word future and in in and we were thinking of future with respect to the title and opportunities coming in, you know, Alice and I were thinking, well, you know, where is this field going? Especially with respect to what we've talked about today. We know there's going to be more data coming out. There's definitely more comput computational power on a on a uh, coming out. And models are getting more larger and larger. Now we have you know, it's not uncommon to have millions of agents with inside of a of a, a a model, something that wasn't possible five, ten years, five, five years ago. Now it really is quite common. Um, there's a massive growth in machine learning and agent-based modeling, using machine learning either to derive behaviors for the parameters to that go into to inform the agent's decision making, or it using machine learning like reinforcement learning to help agents make decisions during runtime of the model and then of course looking at the patterns coming out of this as well and you know with with things like dynamic data simulation one can actually do potentially do real-time simulations and and then as new data comes in also see how your model is tracking there there's also a growth in um this notion of the metaverse, you know, which dates back to the, um, was it 30 odd years ago when Steve, Neil Stevenson published his book Snow Crash and, and people living in sort of this virtual, living in the real world, but the vast majority of their time was spent in a virtual world or a metaverse, which is being sort of made popular more recently with um, Facebook coming out. You know, but metaverses have been around for a long time. Like oh, people have been trying to play around with metaverses for a while. So Second Life, for example, back in the two thousand early early two thousands, for example, this bottom screen here is some of our early attempts to do age based modeling in a metaverse. But now we have computation. We could potentially, you know, build metaverse simulations. And it goes very much back to this digital twin notion that I, um, Alison mentioned right at the beginning of today's talk. But there are big challenges with respect to, you know, linking models together. At the moment, if you, if you most of the simulations that you've seen today in our talk, we're looking at one problem, that of say pedestrian movement or crime or urban growth or, um, or 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 um, wildfire evacuations. But if I go back to this one, this slide, everything is connected together both with respect to the aggregation and representative nation notion of things that Alison mentioned, but also just, you know, housing markets, housing markets, house prices don't, uh, are impacted by 
demographics, by traffic, accessibility, things like that. It, traditionally in modeling, we've start linking models together. Climate change, for example, doesn't look, look, if you have a climate change model, it's not just looking at, say, the atmosphere or water temperature, sea surface temperature, it's actually linking different models together, coupling. We're not doing that very well in the social sciences yet. And potentially with digital twins, one can do this. And also um, potentially embedding us inside of these metaverses, or, you know, the idea is embedding us inside of agent-based models. And Paul Torrance, for example, and his geosimulation um, work is an, example, is an example of that. So there's a lot of, I think, potential here with respect to, you know, where this field is going. And it links very much to GIS and geographic information science. Um, if people are interested in this, Alison's written some, and we, I should say, have written some really quite nice paper, papers on this. If anyone's looking for a job, I would like to play around and develop either digital twins and social and do analytics. I currently have a, a postdoc position going for two years, a bit of self-promotion there. And now we'll just finish and just say thank you so much for listening. And we welcome any questions that you guys might want to give us. And I'll stop sharing our screen. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, your work, uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, the CUC, the cities and society, it's really an amazing work. And now, as Andrew said, uh, we will pass to the question sessions. And actually, we have two questions now and well, three in YouTube streaming. We have another question. And if you have another more, uh, you can put it in the chat box and I'll read it to Dr. Allison and Andrew. And so the first question is, what do you think is the future on vector-based GIS, uh, GIS agent-based models, especially how can they couple with GIS software? Oh, shall I? I'll, I'll start on that one. I think Andrew probably has more sensible things to say, but um, it, it's really interesting. Um, that that sort of whole trying to couple them together, interact together, would um, it really is assuming that the GIS software is up to it. Now, all the GIS sort of models I've played around with, the coupling has been very loose or completely detached that you take your outputs and bring them on. You've got more platforms coming in that can handle GIS um, levels. We're, we're way on from agent analyst in ArcGIS where you have a GeoMason, which is really nice at bringing in geographical information in there. You've got NetLogo as well. So I, I think we are moving in the right direction in terms of integrating these Two together in the in terms of vector, uh, you know things like Unity, uh, other plat other platforms, which I'm sure they're around as well. There's been work in the UK uh, looking at constructing cities inside uh, GIS data in these types of platforms and putting our agents in as well. So it might not be explicitly GIS, but you know there is uh, this sort of type of geographical data, vector data, really is starting to integrate in different types of platforms, but not in the GIS so GIS software. I say it's more GIS coming to the agent-based model rather than the other way around. I'll leave it. Andrew, do you have anything no. else on that? <laughs> no, I, I was going to mention agent analyst. And I think we've come a long way from there. And I think, you know, if looking f in, forward, you do have some really, I, I think the loose coupling is going to be the pre predominant way like Gamma is doing at the moment, uh, being developed over it is, is probably one of the best GIS ve vector platforms out there um but also company pr companies that you would never afford gaming companies like improbable um and they have some amazing vector gis functionality with inside their game engines right um and you know running the problem with vector data is always going to be the geometry and the calculations the computational be power behind that but with cloud computing you can get a, you can get away from that sort of help alleviate some of those problems as long as you have money to spend on cloud computing you can get away you can actually run really large scale ge vector models these days and that's what what's improbable is doing um through their through their uh, linkages to um google and amazon cloud services and the same with to some extent sand sand table so you know i don't but yeah i don't think gis vendors are going to go there i think it's going to be th third party vendors that are going to be taking the role and leading these areas Okay, thank you very much. And the next question is, have you considered integrating in agent-based model the effects of GIS technologies on individual decisions, such as waste regarding traffic? 
Y yes, I mean, yeah, probably not in a GIS. I mean, that that sort of. Um, so, if I if I heard that correct, answer the question correctly, have I thought about integrating GIS, the impact of individual decisions within GIS? Is that right? Did yeah. I hear that? Um, no. Well, yes and no. I mean, kind of just following on from the last question, actually, it does segue in quite nicely that a lot of the sort of more sophisticated environments that we would work within now have that capability of agents can interact with the environment, they can make a decision, the environment affects what they do, and it feeds back. So there is a relationship there ongoing. Um, whether you would do that explicitly, I mean, I guess it really depends on whatever the application is you're looking at, but I can imagine there are some cases where you need to explicitly have your GIS here and your ABM here and not have this sort of integrated platform. So the um, rubbish answer, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay but, thank you very but, much but one thing that would be fascinating though and this is what with ways and platforms like that do have the ability to do now is to give you real-time data which you could then use to help better calibrate or validate your your model something that you know that wasn't available 20 10, 5 10 years ago now we have that those platforms are giving that data so if you wanted to really take Alison and Nick's approach with the dynamic data simulation, ways and those sense technologies on your phones um, allow you to do, would really potentially really help there. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question is from YouTube and it says, which one do you consider the most difficult variable to predict in the urban environment? Oh, people, anything to do with people. I know, <laughs> pop out question. That Trafalgar Square uh, thing I showed you at the beginning, uh, who are those people? What are they doing? Why are they there? You know, that kind of question, you know, what are they going to do next? What what are people actually going to do? When does one person, 10 people become a crowd, become a riot? I would say anything to do with behavior in, in, my, in my experience. I don't know, Andrew, did you? No, no, pe no, people in general. Like, for example, you know, when people, will the housing people. market, but when will the housing market bubble burst? When will this area become gentrified? When will, the, you know, a riot break out here or a stampede or a crowd thing here? You know, anything that's really emergent that involves people making random decisions, or not even random decisions, just decisions in general, right? Short term, like just deciding where to live will cause property markets to emerge. Eventually, that property market will b b burst potentially or not. Right. London still property market still hasn't burst yet. Right. And it's been going up and up and up for the last 10 years or so. Right. But eventually, you know, it will have it has to burst at some point or does it. But that's the people issue. People are really hard to understand. It goes back to the quote we had in the talk. Imagine how hard physics would be if particles could think. And I think, you know, anyone who says the social sciences or the geographical sciences are the easy sciences compared because it's not like physics and things like that. I think it's not necessarily true. <laughs> Totally. Okay, well, thank you to both of you. We are out of time and see you with the next um, keynote. We will have Dr. Daniel Rivas Bell and see you in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello.
Hello, everyone. Uh, we are about, about to start. Good morning. And thank you for all being here uh, for the following keynote conference we are about to enjoy. Uh, before introducing Daniel Rivas Bell, I would like to remind you, everyone, that we have 15 minutes, 50 minutes allowed to the talk and some plus for questions. And if you have questions, you have to put it in the chat box and someone of the staff will handle me, handle the questions to me, and I read it to Dr. Daniel Rivas. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be in this conference because uh, um, maybe not of you, not all of you knows the data lab, but this project of Central Health is based almost all of them in Daniel Rivas' work, especially um, the learn uh, the teaching work job that has been done these years. Uh, so it's why I'm so happy to be the one that person introduced him. And today's conference is titled Building Geographic Data Science in Python, the vision, the book, and the community, and will be delivered by Professor Daniel Rivas Bell from the Department of Geography and Planning of the University of Liverpool. And he is senior uh, lecturer, associated professor in geographic data science. And he runs the uh, master's degree in geographic data science and is a member of the geographic data science lab. Uh, he is deputy program director for urban analytics and part of the Alan Turing Institute. And he develops the Python, Python library with some fellows and participate as a mentor in three Google Summer of Code programs. Uh, together with Serge Ray and Levi Wolf, he is currently writing the book of Geographic Data Science in Python that I think we were going to talk about it. And thank you very much, Dr. Daniel Rivas, for being here. We go with you. Thanks very much, Karime. That's really, really kind and inspiring. I'm going to try to share my slides and pray that the planets align and this works and that you all can see. Can you see my slides now? Can I get confirmation from anyone? Yes, we are looking at them. And if I move them, it, yeah, move it moves. To... It Excellent. Moves. Nice. Great. Super. Well, thanks very much. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to and, and a lot of fun to be able to talk about the things I enjoy the most, uh, but particularly when it's for um, for great people, it, it's it's even better. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, Karima did a way too kind introduction uh, about me, so I'm not going to say much more about um, what pays the bills for my job. Uh, and I'm going to jump straight into the talk. Uh, which if you want to follow along uh, the slides that I'm using today are also in the spirit of, of the book and, and much of what we're going to be talking about are available online um, in, in an open way. So you can either uh, scan the QR code if uh, you're into that kind of thing, or you can head over to the URL on the slides and uh, go um, to that if you're a little bit more old fashioned like myself. And before I go with the actual talk, I, I should say that probably maybe actually most people won't have heard that we have a book coming or that we have a book. Uh, and in some ways, the whole talk is structured around the book. But a lot of what I'm trying to do with these is not only at least selling the book, uh, which is not even uh, for sale yet, uh, but hopefully giving it a common thread and an intellectual Kind of lineage that helps me articulate several of the ideas that have been behind writing the book. So writing the book has been one activity that's taken most of our times or a good chunk of our times in the last couple of years. But a lot of the reasons why we did it um, are, I think, are probably more worth of discussion. I think using the book as the common thread, it's a it's a useful device. So we have a book, uh, which is not quite a correct statement. We almost have a book. The book it was uh, meant to drop in September 2021, but uh, some of you might have noticed that there were a few things happening in the last couple of years that were slightly disruptive, and, and now we moved it to um, coming soon. 
but in the meantime, no worries, because you can already check out uh, the book as it will be, or as, as we have it today, and we think it'll be. And if you want, you can run it for free on your browser, as long as you're connected to the internet. And if you're so inclined, you can also go on the uh, GitHub repository and check out what's behind, check out the guts of the of the book. And I'll talk about all of those elements with a bit more detail towards the end of the of the talk. Uh, I'm going to say one slide about uh, the people behind the book, or at least the people directly behind the book, because indirectly this is a, a much bigger endeavor that would bring a much bigger crowd. Uh, but the authors on the on the book is Professor Serge Ray at University of California Riverside, uh, Levi Wolf, who's uh, a senior lecturer at Bristol, and myself, who's in, um, based in in Liverpool. So, against the background of this of this book that we're writing that we haven't even written fully yet, but against the the background of the idea and and the project, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is these three key elements. The, a little bit on, on the why. Why did we write this book? And, and with that, I'll try to delve into what we call the vision for geographic data science, which is a much bigger enterprise that um, definitely doesn't only include search, Levi and I, is, is a much broader um, uh, idea. Then I'll spend a little bit of time on, on what the book is about and what the book isn't. And hopefully that will be useful to, to give you a sense and to want you to read, get you to want to read the book, but also, and probably more importantly, it'll hopefully give you a sense of what we mean by geographic data science. I'll talk a little bit in the first part and that will be maybe a bit conceptual. And then in the second part, maybe it'll land some of those abstract ideas to, um, to more, more specific uh, notions. And then the final bit of the talk, which will be about Third, a third of it, uh, I want to spend some time talking about the idea of building a community around the book, but more importantly, around the, the idea of geographic data science. The book, in some ways, it's only a vehicle for, for communicating some of these ideas. And, and this, again, is not only about the book, but the book will be, I think, a good example of, of many uh, of much broader ideas. And hopefully, I'll be able to, to unpick those, those two. But before we get into the, the specifics, let's start from the beginning and talk a little bit about why we would write a book in, in 2021 um, or in 2020, or sorry, in 2018, when, which is when we finally decided to uh, pull the trigger and go ahead. And with this, what I'm gonna really talk about is why, why we think that writing a book around geographic data science makes sense in, in 2021. And what is this idea of geographic data science, which for some people might be familiar, but many in the audience might not be familiar. And when I'm talking about these things, I always go back to, to the basics and the, you know, hopefully very simple. I don't like slides with equations and if they have emojis, it's better than if they don't. So here is a slide that has no equations and has a lot of emojis. So hopefully um, this will be of, of um, appeal. I always go back to the early 2000s when I'm talking about data science and geographic data science by extension, because really is there when when some of the, I don't know if intellectual, but some of the foundations were being created and many people at the time who were involved in it didn't quite realize that that was what, what was going on. But it, to me at least, and there's very different views um, that there's, and depending on how you define data science, there's many ways of, of slicing it and in some ways, data science has been around for much longer. But I think in its most modern incarnation, what we today think about when we talk about um, data science, it starts to me in the early 20th century, uh, uh, just around the, the dot-com bubble uh, had burst and a brand new wave of companies in Silicon Valley started um, generating or coming up with new business models that were entirely or almost entirely built around services that were delivered fully online. And in this uh, group, you can think of uh, Google is probably the most prominent one and one of the earliest ones. If you're a bit older and I'm going to start showing my age, there was something called Yahoo, which uh, at one point in time seemed invincible. And uh, this is way before Google. And then a little bit afterwards, others, you know, Facebook or as 
they call themselves now Meta, uh, came around in 2007, I think, Twitter 2008. Um, and around the first 10 years of the 20th or 21st century, there was a set of companies that started realizing that because their core business was running online, and by running online, what I mean is that it was depending on a bunch of servers providing some functionality to users, everything their users were doing was being recorded in a server log. And in the beginning, this wasn't more than just a log, a server log where um, interactions with the website were being recorded on a database. But at some point, someone started realizing that there was a lot more value in those data, in those logs that, that they had originally realized. And they started building more and more business models around the data that was collecting, which in at the end of the day, that data was a, a reflection or a mirror of the behavior of their customers, right? And in the early days, a lot of this was really storing data. It was just compiling logs for when the server or the data center crashed to be able to, to realize uh, what had happened and, and hopefully fix it in time. But uh, as the years progressed, and definitely as we get into the uh, 2010s, people started realizing that having a lot of data could potentially be very useful, but it wasn't immediately. And the solution or the, the response that industry started generating and that at some point later, uh, academia, the research world and, and government started uh, waking up to as well, was what we today call uh, data science. A combination of a little bit of statistics, a little bit of computer science, mostly in the area of what used to be called artificial intelligence, then became machine, machine learning, and now is somehow uh, circling back into artificial intelligence. A little bit of information visualization, quite a bit of domain expertise to know what the data was actually measuring, and then sprinkle a little bit of storytelling, and you have modern data science. This is um, what was invented somewhere in around the, the 2010s and um, definitely started becoming a, a, I don't know, a field is a big word, but a thing that people would call themselves. A, a, people who start calling themselves data scientists. And there's a famous article in the Harvard, Harvard Business Review in 2012, I think they called the data scientists the sexiest job of the century. And that's when you know you've, you've made it, when you've turned uh, computer code and numbers and equations into the sexiest thing you could be doing, that's a clear sign of, of success, or at least of, of hype. And while this was happening, data was spreading well beyond um, the tech world, and it started permeating in a lot more aspects of society than we had originally imagined would be possible. And what ended, what started with uh, simple server logs recording online behavior on very specific platforms, it started becoming a record of pretty much everything that we do in our lives as we go about it and also of everything that is going on that is not human behavior. You can think of uh, satellites orbiting the Earth and capturing images, or you can think of sensors recording uh, air quality um, measurements. All of these things, which, and particularly the two examples that I've given, well, actually all of the examples, all of these things, when you think about them, they're inherently spatial or geographic problems or at least there are uh, questions and phenomena that had a very clear spatial dimension to it. And the issue that we started realizing, and when I say we, um, I mean the Geographic Data Science Lab, which was set up in, in uh, 2013 in, uh, at the University of Liverpool, originally founded by Professor Alex Singleton. And I, my claim of fame is that I was employee number two. And then since then we've grown a little bit. But definitely this was, wasn't the only place where some of these ideas were, were percolating. There were many other departments of geography, some departments of economics, some departments of sociology, um, some departments of computer science that were very much attuned to what was called and what is called G, GI science, geographic information science. In all of these places, the, the sentiment that data science was inherently about data that was mostly spatial but that actually wasn't being recognized, was a sentiment that somewhere in the mid 
2010s, I would say, with a, a few years after data science became a thing and, and people started realizing that most people were trying to answer qu questions about spatial data without realizing that that was the case. Um, then we started thinking about how could we enrich data science and how could we complement and, and augment data science in a way that it's reflective of everything that we've been working um, for the last 30 years in the field of geography and, and geographic information science. And here is where we started with the idea of calling something a geographic data science and that most data science is inherently implicitly or explicitly spatial. It uses geographic data. Maybe we should recognize that. And uh, although this paper came out earlier this year, officially, that's more of the quirks of the editorial uh, world, uh, which if you've ever tried to submit or get a paper published, you will know that it's not an immediate process. Um, but this paper, we started writing in about 2015, 2016, and we try to capture some of these ideas and some of these um, proposals that we started realizing we thought were, were necessary, or at least were, were useful. So I'm not going to delve into a lot of detail into the paper, but if you're interested, the paper is open access and it's it's out in the wild now. So you can go and, and read it and critique it and, and rant about it and, and, and hopefully it'll spark some, some thoughts. If you instead don't want to read it and want the gist of it, basically this is what we what we try to say in between the lines of, of, of the paper. This, the, the notion of geographic data science to us is a place for interaction much more than um, replacement, as some people have wrongly read it. It's a place for interaction between GI science, uh, geographic information science, and, and geography more broadly, and the emerging area or domain of, of data science. And the point that we were trying to make in the paper wasn't that we shouldn't have data science or that we shouldn't have GI science anymore, we should only have geographic data science, is not nearly as ambitious or as, as bold or stupid, is, that, is much more than instead what we should have is people who do data science talking to people who do GI science, and in particular, people who are working at the cutting edge of, of data, of using modern data, they should probably talk to, to people who've been working with spatial data for a long time. And the point of this is that we firmly believe that if that happened, if there was a lot more cross-pollination and a lot more interaction, um, there, this would give rise to a lot of innovation of things that neither the data science community nor the GI science community by themselves would be able to, to create. And hopefully with a bit of uh, luck, it would also avoid a lot of reinventing the wheel. And by this, I mean cases where, and cases where there are solutions proposed for problems that in some ways they had been either solved before or uh, for the most part, there were a lot of, there was a clear recognition that that was a problem and that there had been a lot of advancement at, at least towards a solution. And when I talk about geographic data science, I like to make the stress that this should be, uh, this double uh, arrow here is not random. It's, it's very, very uh, purposeful. And the idea is not that data science should learn from GA science only. What we're trying to argue with, with geographic data science is that there's also a lot of value for geography and GA science to benefit from some of the modern developments and technologies that data science has been pushing. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to get at is building a community that brings the two worlds together around collaboration in a way that, that makes more than the sum of its parts. And for us, this community will only be truly successful if it can be um, diverse, inclus inclusive, and, and welcoming. By diverse, um, I mean that it shouldn't only be white male engineers. A lot of data science and computer science and STEM fields suffer from this problem of, of underrepresentation, that they are mostly represented by a minority that doesn't sort of map onto what society um, looks like. And that's a problem mostly. Well, that is a problem because a lot of the problem, a lot of the questions and phenomena that data science is working with are uh, things that affect most of the population. Anything from serving good adverts in, in Amazon to determining whether someone should get a loan that would allow them to get a, 
a house and move into a new neighborhood. So when data is permeating everything, the people who work with data and particularly with geographic data should be as representative of the of the whole as as possible. Um, it should be inclusive in the sense that it shouldn't only be very technical people coming from computer science, I think, and, and this actually dovetails really nicely with some of the ending thoughts that um, Alison and, and Andrew, for those who were in the previous talk, um, ended on with this idea that social scientists have truly uh, unique aspects to contribute to, to the discussion. And, and I think that should be very much the point in, in a geographic data science. And it should also be welcoming in the sense that historically, or at least, and this is me showing my age again, but uh, in my experience, it hasn't been the easiest to get started in, in fields that had a computational element. And you know there might have been good reasons for that in the past, in the sense that it was very cutting edge. You re it required a lot of uh, background skills without which you couldn't even get started. But that's definitely not the case in 2021 in, in the field of data science and, and geographic data science. So the field should be as easy to get into as possible. And it also should be welcoming enough that people want to stay, that it doesn't, uh, it's not only about making it easy to, to get started and then people realizing that that's not a place where they want to spend more time or when they want to commit their efforts to. So, diverse, inclusive, and welcoming. And hopefully some of the ideas that I'll talk about in, in a second around the book and, and the broader ecosystem that we've built around the book will uh, resonate towards um, these points. So that's the first part of the talk, the idea of the vision of what we think geographic data science is or should be or, or why it would have to be. The second part of the talk is, is more specific on what is geographic data science, or more pragmatically speaking, what, what have we, how have we built the book and how have we designed it? And, and by implication, what do we think geographic data science should contain from a more uh, practical point of view? And this is a, an image that we created when we were pitching the book to edit to publishers, where we were trying to find someone to, to publish our book. Um, editorials usually ask you to, to send a small, a short form on why they should publish that book and why you think it'll be an uh, absolute bestseller. And in that form, we, we included this, this Venn diagram. And our pitch or our, our argument at the time, and I think for the most part, it stands, uh, it stands true today. And hopefully it'll stand true a little, a few more months until the book goes out, is that of these three areas, the um, domain of data science, GIS, and then uh, technical books on Python, you could pick any two and you would find at least one book, if not more than one. And, and some of them are pretty well established. But it was really hard for us, and in fact, it was impossible to find anyone that dipped into the three areas that was talking about uh, or that was founded on GIS, on Geographic Information Systems, that it was concerned with geographic data that was covered entirely around the Python or that was written entirely around the Python uh, programming language and that took a, a modern data science centric approach that wasn't a GIS book written in Python or that it that it wasn't that that it we couldn't find anything that included also a modern perspective on, on data science that was um, just as friendly to uh, traditional aspects of statistics as it was to uh, machine learning, for example, and that it didn't treat data cleaning, for example, uh, in a traditional way, but that it approached it in a more modern um, data pipeline type of way. So that's what we set out to, that's what we pitched and that's what we, well, that was approved and that's what we set out to, to do. So this is, if you have to keep one slide on what the book is about, this is really it. Now I'll tell you a slide of what the book is, is not, because I think in, in some ways it's a lot more useful to understand what we're trying to do with, with this book. Um, it's not a GIS starter. What do we mean by this? I mean, that is not a book about the fundamentals and the basics of geographic information systems. 
we don't take the traditional approach of starting with um, encoding different types of phenomena and different types of data, and then the idea of layers, the idea of uh, operations on those data, et cetera. Many of those concepts, however, do feature in the book, and they are sprinkled in different parts of the, of the book. But we don't take, it's, it's not an introduction for geographic information science. It's not a GIS 101 type of book. It's a book that uses GIS as a vehicle for communicating other types of ideas. It's also not an introduction to programming. That doesn't mean that if you don't know how to program, you, you shouldn't read the book. The book, for the most part, has been built around the idea that you don't need to know any programming to get up to speed. But what I mean by this is that you don't, what you won't get with the book is a traditional introduction to programming fundamentals. We don't have a chapter on control flow. We don't have a section on for loops. We don't have a, um, a section on data structures for, for information when you're programming. We do touch on all of those things as we go along the book, but they're introduced as an, and when they're needed again, as vehicles for communicating other kinds of ideas and, and concepts. And finally, what this book is also definitely not is a, an in-depth volume about any about anything. It's, it's much more what we call an in-breath treatment of, of many topics. So what we're trying to do is cover a really, really wide uh, range of vision to provide you an overview of what we think you should know to get started in doing data science with geographic data. But because it's only a book, it's not a, an, a, a 10 volume uh, compilation, the trade-off here is that we need to, to give up some of, the, some of the detail, or in fact, a lot of the detail. And, and what we settled on is be very wide ranging and for every aspect, give you the intuition of what it is, what kinds of problems it can solve and how you can get started in each of them. And then in case you're interested, we provide a lot of pointers for much more in-depth treatments in the, in the literature. And where we can, we, we direct you to the main uh, book or the main set of papers that, that would be, or we consider would be the best next steps that you could take uh, in each of those areas. But if you're looking for an in-depth treatment on, on spatially constrained clustering, for example, you won't find it here. You will find a section and then a list of references and where where to go next. Or if you're looking for an in-depth treatment of spatial regression or spatial econometrics, again, this is not uh, your place. This is, this is a place where you can get a, an overview and then find out where to go next. And finally, the, a little another thing that at the time I thought it wasn't particularly useful, but in fact, it was actually extremely useful when we did it, um, that publishers or some publishers uh, ask you to do when you're uh, pitching a book is thinking about who are the personas or the, the stylized customers that you would see this book being sold to or who would benefit. And, you know, academics being academics, certainly when I, we didn't think that was our job, we weren't in the, mar in the, in the business of marketing anything. But this exercise actually helped us focus a lot of the ideas that were somewhat floating in the air when we were talking about the book, but weren't quite um, quite as, as uh, well defined. And, and the list that we came up with was something around um, this slide. It's, we think this book is, is a great introduction for data scientists who are working in a data science company or in a government um, division that works a lot with data. And it, data scientists who are working with data that have at least some spatial dimension, but are not particularly trained on how to make the most of, of that spatial and geographic dimension. That's a great place to start. Um, we think the book is a great place to get started um, for that kind of people. It's also, we think, a great uh, resource for traditional GA scientists who've been working in GA science for a long time, but want to engage a little bit more with the up and coming world of data science, want to refresh a little bit of the skills um, that they've been uh, growing and see a little bit of different perspective on working with data and working with spatial data than probably the one that they would be uh, accustomed to. And finally, we think it's also a great book for scientists and social scientists who are getting started working with geospatial data and they've never uh, worked with it before. And 
this is a bit of an ambitious one, but I think it's a necessary one to include because what we think is what one of the somehow in between the lines ideas that we have in the book is that if you're getting started with data, you probably should be engaging with data science. And if much of that data is GIS, you probably should learn some of those concepts too. The idea of geographic data science is, is bringing those two areas into one so you don't have to duplicate and, and there's less cognitive load in switching from one to, to the other. And for that purpose, we think that the book is a great, uh, is a great place for, to start for, for that group as well. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly because if you're interested in what the book actually has, you can go to the website geographicdata.science or was last book and check it for yourself. But I'll just say that there's three main blocks. There's uh, uh, a first part around what we call the building blocks, which is geography for data scientists a little bit, uh, data science for, for geographers, which is the second chapter, and then a couple of more fundamental uh, concepts chapters. Then there's an element of, there's a part on spatial data analysis where we look at the, uh, the basic analytical tools, the basic analytics to think spatially when you're working with data. And then we have a third part where we build on the other two to try to get a bit further into a bit more sophisticated areas. And we cover, we have a chapter on spatial inequality. We have a chapter on unsupervised learning or, or clustering and spatial clustering, a chapter on spatial regression, and a chapter on, on what we call spatial feature engineering, which is a lot of uh, what traditionally people would have called data cleaning or data wrangling landed on uh, on geographic data and wrapped up around the language and jargon that machine learning people would be used, used to or data science. And from a tech perspective, the, the stack that we're using or what we're something we're very keen on doing also in this book is bringing together these two spheres of technology that in many ways have existed um, somewhat disconnected from each other. And on the one hand, on, on the right side of the slide, there's the, the standard, the now standard data science stack, which uses libraries like Pandas, X-Array, Scikit-Learn, which is probably the, the most popular one, Matlab, Seaborn, with the up and coming uh, GI science stack in Python, things like GeoPandas, which extends pandas, Rosterio, which extends or combines with X-Array for, for raster data and, and images, PySAL that provides the analytical layer on top of data structures, OSMNX for, for graphs, for spatial graphs, contextually for base maps, and, and we use a bunch of other libraries. And a final a bonus on the book that is, it won't be part of the, of the dead tree copy, but it is part of the website. All of the data sets that we use in the book are sourced and harvested from, uh, from the real world. We didn't invent anything, but because for the book, we need something that was a bit more polished, uh, we pre-prepare pre them. But at the same time, we felt a little bad that we were writing a book about data science, which is about combining data sets, et cetera. And we were using prepackaged data for everything. So the middle ground that we found was uh, all of the code that we use to uh, prepare the data is also part of the book. And the, there's a, an appendum at the end of the, of the book that covers everything. So if you want to see the code we actually use to create the data sets, it's, it's all there for everyone to, to see. And in the last, what do we have, five, 10 minutes, or maybe something like 10 minutes, I want to uh, finish with a few thoughts on the broader context in which the book, but also the notion of geographic data science exists today. And, and a lot of that has to do with technology, but hopefully I'll be able to, to make some links to, to community building. Uh, the book is written in Python. I'm not going to start another language war here. There's a lot of reasons why we thought that that was, uh, that was good. One of them was actually that there weren't other books in, uh, around these areas in, in Python. And, and we thought that was a niche and this is not by any means to say that other languages are not good uh, within those other great languages, but we have happened to have been working with Python for a long time. And we think that it's, it's a really solid option if you're getting started in data science. In fact, I would argue is the main option, uh, at least today. We're taking a, what we call a radically open approach, which uh, unfolds in, in three stages. So on the one hand, it's open in the sense that we have a website for the book. You can check the, 
you, you'll be able to read the book online and free without paying for the for the copy. Uh, you can follow the updates every time that there's a, um, a, uh, a talk like this one. We put it up on, on the website, etc. But it's not only the, the activity around the book, it's the book itself. It's entirely hosted on, on GitHub, on our repository. And you can go and check not only the content of the book, but the infrastructure that we use to serve the book as a, as a website. And something that to me is what makes it radically, that, that puts it radically in radically open, is that we're doing this live in the open. We, we haven't written the book in a cave and then decided one day to share it with the world. From day one, we started with the, with the open approach. So every change that we make, you can follow on the, on the feed. Every mistake that we make, you can also see. And hopefully, if you spot it, you can tell us. And every time we fix something, you can also see it. And we think that this is also really important because there's a lot of mystery and, and mystique around creating um, these artifacts. And, and people don't realize, A, maybe how, how much work it is, but also how much of a human endeavor it is. It, it seems like, as I, as I was saying, people prepare books in the you know, in the dark and then one day come up and the book is fully fully done and and that's definitely not what we're what we're doing another aspect that i think that well definitely the book but i think it's is one of the key benefits i think for data science and and geographic data science by extension is that code is an intellectual vehicle for communicating other more complex ideas so it's this notion of code as text, and, and we use that very heavily on, on the book. And I think geographic data science is also one of the, the main pillars, is the idea that when you're trying to make an argument, where you're trying to build a narrative, part of that is best described in, in human language, but part of that sometimes is even, is even better described in computer language. And we should demystify the use of code, I think, in, in narrative building, and we definitely do that, take that approach in the in the book. So this is something that Serge, Serge Ray has been arguing for a really long time, and he calls code using code as, as text or as a textbook. But we also flip this approach and we use text as, as code. And we recognize, and again, we definitely do this in the book, but more generally uh, from a geographic data science perspective, we recognize that a lot of what we're expressing in narrative is entirely based on computational experiments. And unless you treat those as such, and unless you treat your narrative as a computational artifact, you won't necessarily be able to build trust on, on those results. So uh, in the case of the book, the book is actually treated as a software library, where every time we, we follow standard software practices, and every time that we make a change, there's a, a, a host of robots on GitHub that uh, run a bunch of tests and make sure that that change didn't break anything and that the book is still reproducible and that if you run it, it'll uh, it'll reproduce on your computer what uh, what created in on ours. It's also something that uh, this is not entirely the book, but it's it's one of the sort of satellite projects slash slash pet projects that I've developed over the last couple of years. Um, the technological stack on which much of data science works and, and particularly geographic data science runs on. It's a miracle of science and engineering. It's uh, and also of, of community building, I think, because it's, it's the perfect example of a highly distributed group of humans working almost without knowing uh, for the greater, you know, for a greater goal, which is building this, this stack that allows you to do anything from reading data to, to predicting um, human populations, for example. Now, it's it's a miracle that it doesn't, well, that is, that is great once it works, right? Once it's properly installed, and actually that turns out to be pretty tricky. So one of the things that we're very keen on the book, but more, more broadly, um, this is another endeavor of the Geographic Data Science Lab at Liverpool and, and more people, is making sure that talking to that inclusivity and, and being welcoming, that installing this is not off-putting, is not putting off people who, who would otherwise be interested in getting involved. So here is one example where what I call the GDS environment, which provides a, a containerized, a, a packaged up uh, stack that everyone can run and install. And it's not super hard to install, but because it's not trivial either, if you're not um, 
very tech savvy, we've developed a lot of uh, materials and, and guides for making sure that everyone, whatever their their computational setup is, can run um, can run the stack and then can, you know, it's almost like the ticket to ride uh, the geographic data science uh, roller coaster, right? Uh, yeah, unless you you can do things on your computer, you're you're just an spectator. So this goes to to lowering the barriers of of making people um, not only spectators but participants in in the whole thing. So I'm hoping I'm not out of time. Uh, in any case, I'm going to shut up. Uh, and before that, I'll just say the book is out there, at least um, at a 90% of, of completion or almost 90%. Uh, you can try it out even if you don't install anything because we use uh, a marvelous project called Binder that provides a computational backend in the cloud for running, uh, running documents. Uh, so you can run it on your browser as long as you're connected to the internet. And if you find any problems or you have any suggestions, I would very much encourage everyone to, to report them because this is it's a human endeavor and as such, it's uh, it's probably full of mistakes. So the more eyes that are laid on on it, the more uh, chances of of finding them and and hopefully uh, of fixing them. So if you find any any issue, uh, please file a ticket on on GitHub and we'll get to that as soon as possible. And with that, I'm going to uh, leave it there. And if there's any question, I'll be very happy to take them. Thank you very much, Danny, for uh, this great, 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 great presentation and for uh, sharing all these links and and, uh, and uh, promoting the book. I'm sure uh, a lot of people in the audience are very excited to try it out. And we have one question uh, already. Uh, so this question may be from my ignorance on the topic. I have always wondered how we got down one step in the data information knowledge wisdom pyramid, and more importantly, why it was necessary. If we already had climbed up to the geographic information science, why we should go back to the data level? Shouldn't we be looking for ways to move up in the pyramid from information to knowledge instead? Yeah, that's a great, um, great question. Um, I guess my main, uh, well, the short answer is yes, we should. Um, but I wish I had that cloud in um, moving terms and making names popular. And I suppose that the main, definitely from our point of view, I, I can't speak for other people, but um, from our point of view at Liverpool and, and in the book, our motivation for calling this geographic data science rather than geographic knowledge science or geographic information science or other you know names that would be um, probably more appropriate semantically was to make very very explicit that there is an already existing thing out there in the world that is called data science and that is transforming the world as we know it and we wanted to make crystal clear that this was about bringing the data science community with the geography slash gis gi science communities and we opted for a slightly less semantically correct, but hopefully a bit more uh, widely recognized name that was geographic data science. And, and in a way, yeah, the, it begs the question, should it be knowledge science or data science? But I guess we're a bit more humble than that. And we decided to not get into that, um, into that discussion and, and instead focus on, on making it clear what, was it, what we were trying to, to accomplish. Great. So hopefully that that's uh, not. Yeah, well, I, 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 I believe question, it's, a, it's, it's a very that, complex that topic. Our, but yeah. <laughs> um, our perspective. Yep. Thanks. As I, as I was saying, I think it's a, well, as you mentioned, it's a very complex topic that, that, that needs a little bit more, I think, time for us to get into into that discussion, discussion more, more openly. Uh, thank you. There is another question here. Uh, I don't know if it's going to bring up a lot of debate or not, but I, 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 there was a, in, in one of the, on your slides was it's geographic data science, like uh, highlighted. Uh, what would you say it's the, it's the basic difference between geographic data science and geospatial data science? Is there any? Oh, um, 
now it's probably a misspelling whoever did your space all day <laughs> <laughs> um no i don't i i think this i mean it's the problem with names and i think part of what why we picked one and and we never look back is because we're a bit more focused on the ideas behind the the name rather than the name itself so i'm actually relatively yeah, I'm actually pretty open to other naming conventions. Um, one of my favorite ones is the American slang for geographic data science, which seems to be spatial data science. Um, <laughs> but I think they're all broadly speaking the same thing. I think, I guess we picked geographic data science because we wanted to make very clear that it was a place for cross pollination and interaction between the data science community on the one hand and the geographic information science and then on another hand and those two things we didn't pick the names geographic information science had been around for 30 years has been around for 30 years and data science has now been around for 10 15. so what we wanted to make very clear is that this was a space for people from those two communities to come together you know if i agree that semantically it could should probably be geographic knowledge science uh i I understand why some people call it spatial data science or geospatial data science, and I'm 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 perfectly happy with with all of those, so long as the ideas that are behind the name um, are are clear that this is about bringing people together. That is not about replacing anything. That is not about leaving, you know, carving niches and leaving people out of them. Uh, it's it's very much the opposite. Yeah, yeah that makes perfect. sense. Yep, perfect sense. Thanks. Uh, we have yet another one here. Uh, would you say uh, geographic data science could be considered as a basic science or as a more applied or integrative sort of science? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, again, I think there's an element of that that it's more about semantics than 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 anything else, and that probably doesn't excite me as much but there is an element that is true that or no sorry not true that's a bit there's an element that i think it's important in the question that is is well i read it in two ways is um what's i guess what's unique about geographic data science and 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 what you know what does it have to to ask to to contribute and and should it be something that then other people build on top of? Um, the way I, I don't know that there's already a paper that argues that geographic data science is not a science, and I'm I'm not terribly excited about those debates because I think they direct the attention from the really important thing, which is data science and the data revolution is changing the world, and unless people from the geographic and geospatial and and spatial worlds live up to the expectation, someone else is going to reinvent it. And I think that should be us because we are best placed to, to do, and by us, I mean geographers and people involved with, in the geographic information science community. And I think that's the really important thing. More to the point of the of whether this should be in a, a science or not, in, if, in the paper with, with Alex, the, the, origin, the geographic data science paper, we sort of sketch almost a progression in which geographic data science, we think it will it will emerge. And it's been really interesting to see it evolve because as I said, we started writing this paper in 2015. It only came out this year. And in some ways, some of the things that we write, we wrote were, would probably happen, have already happened by the time they were published, right? So we originally said, well, these two communities will probably start coming together through direct exercises in coupling and you definitely saw this in data science where they started uh, integrating data science platforms with mapping technologies, with more traditional mapping. And then there will be an element of further integration. And ultimately what you will have, and I think, I'm not entirely sure we're, enti we're there yet, but I think we're, we're starting to see signs is elements and methods and techniques. So ultimately this probably plays more to to what the uh, question is about that couldn't have happened in data science or in geoscience science by themselves. And these are elements that, as I like to call, bake spaces right into the data science of it and, and treat it as a first-class citizen. So methodologies from 
areas like machine learning, which traditionally have completely uh, no awareness whatsoever of geographic location in the data, are starting to bake space much more um, prominently. And I think, you know, I don't know if that is the science, if that makes it a science or not, but I do think that those signs are are steps that are starting to show things that wouldn't wouldn't have happened in data science on their own or in GIS on their own. That only happened because these two communities are starting to to come together and starting to to interact more. So I don't know. It's it's a bit of a loaded question. So I, uh, I thought it wasn't super useful, but hopefully that's a no. But it was just great to, to get a, a glimpse of of, of of ideas. So maybe we can start developing our own and and setting some ground. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor? If someone would like to uh, ask a question, raise their hands, uh, come on up. Okay. I don't see any more questions or more questions in the chat box. So Danny, well, thank you very much for your, your awesome presentation and uh, we're going to close up this session right now and we'll take a short break and we will return at uh, 1.30 local time uh, for our workshops. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for the questions and for um, coming up. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I forgot to let you know that today's workshops will not be uh, due to yesterday's uh, problems with the platforms. Today's workshops are not going to be uh, streamed via YouTube. We will record them and make them available once they are done. Uh, but we are, you're only going to be able to be in the workshops if you go to the different rooms where the workshops will take place. Thank you. <laughs>